have uh, several board members that are involved in another panel right now, so I'm hoping that they'll be joining us shortly. But I thought perhaps we could go ahead with the um, budget presentation. We have um, a presentation that staff and Dr. Brabrand have worked um, hard on. Um, I want to give them some kudos for going through the um, the budget amendment that we had in February, and they will be addressing each of those items um, through the presentation today, and we can discuss each of those in uh, more detail after the presentation. So, Ms. Burden, I don't know if you have anything in addition to say or if you want to just get going with the presentation. I just briefly want to say I want to thank Marty, Sean, Lee, Alice, Matthew Norton, and the entire budget team for all the work they've done. We're on the final stretch here. This is the work session before our board um, new business Thursday and then the vote in two weeks. And we really have worked hard to get this budget uh, where we want it. And of course, following your follow on motion, uh, looking at your priorities. And while we haven't been able to do everything, I think you're going to see in this presentation uh, our intent to try to get as many priorities as possible that we think are priorities as well, and you all do, uh, across the finish line. And just a final note, we did work collaboratively with the county. At the very end, there was a little bit of belt tightening on behalf of the collaboration we've done with the county. Brian uh, Hill cut his budget just a bit, and we cut ours just a bit, about $10 million. Um, in a collective effort to support affordable housing in the county, which is a major priority for the county and for the school system too, as many of our employees face rising housing costs to be able to live and work here. So um, we are still in very, very good shape and uh, this team has an excellent presentation. And Mr. Smith, I just wanted to see any comments you wanna share from your team before we get going. <laughs> I think you covered it, Dr. Barry Brandon. I also want to thank our uh, budget chair and vice chairs, Karen Corbett Sanders and Elaine Toland, for their work as we've worked through this budget cycle. Uh, I know that they have uh, done a heavy lifting on their end throughout the budget process, and so we are certainly grateful uh, for all of that support and guidance. So we're off to the races, Ms. Burton. Good morning. Um, this work session is to reconcile the budget to the funding levels provided by the Board of Supervisors as well as distribute funds that were originally included in the budget as placeholders um, and also to provide funding for school board initiatives that were identified in the follow-on motion approved at the advertised budget adoption. Basically, these are changes to the advertised that will then be included in the fiscal 23 approved budget to be adopted on May 26th at the regular meeting and obviously we've decreased local funding by uh, 10 million. Um, and then the superintendent's recommendation as to the other spending categories falls into four major areas, uh, professional development, recruitment and retention strategies, JET initiatives, and then other school board initiatives. Again, this table shows a decrease in the county transfer as a revenue adjustment, and we are reducing one day of professional de development to address that change. We also are distributing the state legislative placeholder. This placeholder was included in the superintendent's proposed budget so that we had funds available should either chamber of the General Assembly include changes that resulted in mandatory expenditure increases that previously weren't under consideration like SOQ changes, at-risk funding, those sorts of things that the state may do that actually affects our expenditure budget, not, not the revenue budget, because we normally think of state funding as being a revenue uh, line item, but there are also often expenditure changes that are coupled with those. Um, the Senate changes from February don't result um, in any changes, nor does the House. Um, it's possible that new changes could be introduced um, at this point, but it's unlikely. And if there are significant changes to the state budget after our adoption, we'll address them at fiscal 22 year end. That's, I think there's been a couple of times historically when the state has had a delayed budget adoption. And in those couple of times, we handled that with, uh, at year end as well. Um, the state's budget work is not yet completed, and we, but we do expect it to be completed by the end of May, early June. 
We're also distributing the placeholder funding for the market analysis the school board requested uh, as a follow-on as part of the fiscal 22 adoption for family liaisons and bus drivers. Um, those uh, studies have been completed, so the funds are being distributed to the appropriate accounts based on the superintendent's recommendation. And so the total amount of funding is available um, is 12.7 million. Again, the superintendent recommendation is categorized into four major areas. Um, we're increasing the professional development funding by a net of 1.4 million, allocating 7 million towards uh, recruitment and retention strategies, 2.4 million for phase one of JET initiatives, and then again, funding for some other smaller school board initiatives. So the details, um, professional de development. Recall that we originally included three additional uh, PD days for all less than 12 month employees in the superintendent's proposed budget, which was then adopted as the advertised. Um, we have reduced one day of professional development due to the reduction in funding levels. We are providing funding to support elementary professional development and planning throughout the year, included an additional and included an additional day of PD for transportation employees. It should also be noted that an existing day in the calendar will be used for PD for a total of two instead of the three originally proposed. So looking at the details a little further, um, the PD and planning for elementary teachers will provide two monitors for every three classes that will provide assistance during recess, opening and closing activities, transitioning, those sorts of things. They'll also be able to collaborate with um, English language learner teachers and special ed and literacy math, AAP resource teachers, and then of course participate in MTSS discussions. And then finally, these monitors will provide time for elementary teachers to focus on assessments, differentiated instruction, and family communication. And the use of these funds for the elementary uh, PD and planning um, begins to close the gap between the amount of PD and planning time currently experienced by elementary teachers compared to their middle school and high school counterparts. Um, continuing with PD initiatives, the two PD days that the superintendent is recommending will support training in literacy, um, ESSER and uh, SIP plans, the trust policy, uh, SRNR, um, in a variety of areas. Um, we had, again, 17 teacher work days originally planned. We have a limited one day due to the funding reconciliation, leaving 16 days in total. Eight of those days are teacher directed, four are school planning days, which may be school directed or teacher directed, and then four are staff development days that are directed by the division. And then we have also included one additional PD day specifically for less than 12 month transportation employees. And you know they cover a variety of things with their professional development, like communication skills, coaching for managers, um, managing conflict, those, those kinds of activities. The second category of recommended adjustments uh, is for recruitment and retention strategies at a cost of $7 million. The largest item under this is a step salary scale extension for all scales um, at $4.2 million, funds set aside for recruitment initiatives like Call Me Mister, and then implementation of the market study for family liaisons and transportation employees. You all are probably aware that step increases in the advertised budget are available only to those eligible, meaning that those at the top of their respective scales would only receive the uh, market scale adjustment of 4%. But we know that we have fewer uh, steps on air scales than surrounding divisions due to the compression of the salary scales um, with the intention of providing additional funds earlier in one's career that was implemented uh, several years ago. And, you know, we often compare unfavorably when somebody looks at the top of our salary scale compared to others. Prince William has 34 steps. Um, I think our teacher step has 23. Uh, Loudoun County has 30 steps on their teacher scale. So we have a, a short scale in comparison to our two closest neighbors. In addition to that, the pandemic, of course, spurred the great resignation. So it's very important that we retain the teachers and other staff members that we have, as well as recruit new ones. 
Um, employees at the top of their respective skills may have enough years to retire, but they're still relatively young, productive, and provide value to FCPS and its students. We want to keep those staff members and extending the salary scale one additional step is a way to do that so that all staff members will receive a step increase plus the MSA. Uh, the cost of this recommendation is $4.2 million and affects about 10 percent of our employees. Continuing with recruitment and retention strategies as a recommendation for implementation of the Call Me Mr. program whose intention is to improve the number of male teachers and teachers of color in our ranks. The program was funded in the fiscal 21 budget, but it ended up on the cutting room floor when local revenue bottomed out due to the pandemic. This plan adds one position to the recruitment office to oversee the program and includes funding for participants tuition assistance. Also included in this line item is funding to allow flexibility in recruitment initiatives for the new uh, human resources assistant superintendent. The recruitment and retention strategy also includes an enhancement of the family liaison salary schedule based on the market study that HR completed at a cost of nearly $1 million. Um, we found that the family liaison salaries and benefits uh, among local jurisdictions were significantly under market. So an enhanced salary scale is recommended um, with a starting salary of $20.95 and a midpoint of 28.96. Um, which will bring family liaisons to 100% of the market midpoint. Uh, funding of, not, of uh, 0.9 million allows FCPS to bring the family liaison salaries uh, within that market goal. The transportation scale redesign. The salary scale for bus drivers, bus driver floaters, and bus driver supervisors was also under review as part of the market comparison study. Um, while the study found that bus drivers were within market, we do have continuing difficulties in hiring bus drivers, which led to the work group to recommend a new salary scale that would establish a premium rate by setting the midpoint at 105 percent. Normally, we set the midpoint at 100 percent, um, but with this, there are special circumstances, so 105 percent seems to be appropriate. Funding of $1.3 million will support the transportation scale redesign. And some other things that you need to know is the superintendent is recommending implementation by moving employees to the closest hourly rate that is not below their current hourly rate. That is the um, routine procedure that we follow when placing uh, employees um, due to reclassification or scale changes is that we place them at the closest hourly rate uh, without going under. This recommendation combines with the step and market scale adjustments uh, will provide bus drivers with an average compensation increase of 8.68%. And over the past two years, the total average compensation increase is 14.38%. And as you all know, future transportation compensation will be addressed by collective bargaining. Can we interrupt you just for a, a logistical matter? Um, Ms. Keys Gamara uh, has submitted a written request to virtually attend today's work session due to a personal conflict. Um, are those uh, all those in favor of granting this request? Yes, yeah, so she can join in and hear the rest of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. That motion is passed. Okay. Thank you. Excuse me. That's okay. Um, the third category um, is JET initiatives, which includes resources to support phase one um, of carbon neutrality to reduce carbon, uh, the carbon footprint, electric bus fleet to reduce the use of fossil fuels and reduce hazardous emissions, uh, funding for safe routes to school and get to green. The um, JET Task Force developed 28 individual recommendations under four areas of focus energy, transportation, waste management, recycling, and workforce development. These areas cross across, um, go across several of our departments, including instructional services, facilities, transportation, um, et cetera. The total cost to address the JET recommendations is $6.4 million uh, and an additional 15 positions over a multi-year plan. For fiscal 23, $2.4 million, or phase one, and five positions uh, are included. 
$1.3 million in two positions are related to the carbon neutrality efforts, um, which would support facility staff, school staff, students um, engaging in learning and applying sustainable practices within their home, work, school, and school settings uh, to reduce the facility and personal carbon footprint. $1.6 million is allocated for the Office of Transportation Services to address the JET recommendations related to the transitioning of our bus fleet from diesel to electric by 2035. That also supports a one coordinator position and the cost share of future electric bus grant opportunities to meet the JET goals. Typically, when we get grants for electric buses, they require a cost share, cost share from FCPS, and so we've included funding to be able to address that. Um, Safe Routes to School, that's been funded through a grant. Um, that grant expires this year, and so uh, a $0.1 million will support the current program by continuing that. And then the remaining $0.3 million in Phase 1 will support two positions for the Get to Green program. Um, that will, uh, the additional staffing will provide equitable access to Get to Green opportunities across all schools and provide support uh, for engaging students in environmental stewardship um, and that sort of thing. The last category um, is other initiatives, and we've included resources to support the special education uh, novice teachers, uh, telehealth services for students' mental health, library staffing for special education centers, a calm space and sensory room at Burke, and then a placeholder for other school board initiatives. The uh, special ed novice teacher support is about 600,000 and it uh, restores five 208 day mentor teacher positions that will provide support, of course, to novice teachers. Um, those positions were um, repurposed in an earlier year and so this uh, inclusion in the superintendent's recommendation um, will restore that. We've also included a placeholder for telehealth, telehealth services for students' mental health. Um, this is just placeholder funding to partner with the Community Services Board to begin telehealth service options for students. Library staffing for high school special education centers. That's about $100,000 and provides an additional point li point .5 librarian to Quanda Road and Cedar Lane, who both currently have a point .5 librarian uh, Burke Center currently has a budgeted 1.0 position, and so we only included the other two. The Calm Space and Sensory Room provides funding for equipment and student materials to implement sensory rooms at Burke School. And then the School Board Initiatives placeholder of $0.7 million. Uh, the follow-on motion listed School Board resources, and we had various budget questions asking about the costing for additional space for school board members, additional aids, legal support, um, and so $0.7 million has been included for the school board to consider, you know, which initiatives they would like to be a priority. So again, just to recap, the superintendent's re recommendation is in four categories. Professional development, recruitment retention, JET initiatives, and then other school board initiatives totaling $12.7 million. There are some outstanding items from the school board follow-on motion that are not being recommended. Um, the ACE fund over the past few years has required an additional supplement due to reduced participation brought about by the pandemic. Historically, that additional supplement has been funded at year end, and the recommendation is that we continue to do that. So if ACE does need uh, an additional supplement, we will include that in our year-end item in um, July. Not recommended are translation services, which was calculated at a ratio of uh, one per 100 for interpreters and translators, um, and that results in 1,025 FTEs or a cost of 98 million. The discussion about middle school start times um, is a continuing discussion. And um, that's certainly something that the new superintendent will, will have on her agenda. So that's not being recommended here either. Clerical staffing for libraries. Um, the state SOQ language uh, for clerical delineates staffing by level and area, 
but it also provides flexibility to distribute staffing among schools that's determined by each locality. Basically, you just have to meet um, the requirement in total, not specifically. We also allow school principals a great flexibility in the areas that their clerical staffing will support. Um, the 23 budget exceeds the overall clerical staffing SOQ, not, not specifically librarians, but all clerical, by about 600 positions. Um, so we're, we're not recommending this. The cost to fully staff an additional one office assistant at each middle, high school, and secondary beyond what is already included in the 23 budget would be um, nearly $3 million. Early childhood assessment and testing staffing. Um, there's been a lot of discussions over the last couple of months about the needs of, of this group, and the uh, student services uh, group has, is going to handle this with Medicaid funding by adding four additional positions to this program, one year only, while they review what the needs are of that program. Assistant principal staffing is also not recommended. Um, recall that the advertised, the proposed budget and the advertised budget um, both included assistant principal staffing formula changes to provide uh, a needs-based factor, and that resulted in 52 new assistant principal positions uh, at a cost of $8.4 million. Family liaison staffing, um, you may recall that in last year's budget, the family liaison total spending was about $3.3 million. And we allocated an additional $3.3 million out of ESSER three, essentially doubling the amount of resources um, that particular initiative had, um, but only for one year. But we did build in that additional $3.3 million into the operating fund in fiscal 23. So they, will, again, will have the same level of funding in fiscal 23 that they had this current year, which is essentially double what it was last year. Um, and of course, the market analysis is addressing the pay um, strategies for that group. And then finally, the budget calendar. Um, this is the time of year that I like because we have like just a couple of things and then we're done with this year and we'll start on fiscal 24's budget. Um, we adopt on May 26 at the regular school board meeting and then we're done. All right, thank you, Ms. Burden. Um, we can open up for questions from the board. Uh, Mr. Frisch, would you like to start us off? Happy to, thank you. Thank you for all the work that's gone into this. I know it has not been easy to reconfigure everything and uh, try to figure out how to allocate these funds. Um, uh, I'm particularly grateful to see the professional development funding uh, around trust policy. That's something that we've been talking about for the last year, and uh, one of the provisions in the policy is uh, robust training for staff. So uh, I'm glad to see that we're funding it there. Um, one of the um, nuggets in here that I believe is a result of some of my budget questions um, is, uh, I want to use the exact language that you've got here, school board initiatives placeholder. So um, I'll want to talk to colleagues offline about what that is. And some of my questions were intended with the idea of, yes, maybe we could fund that depending on the cost. Some of them were a wondering of what it would cost and an idea of what we might do in the years ahead. So I'll want to talk to colleagues about that as well. Um, I did want to note that when you look at the Joint Environmental Task Force uh, funding, which I'm grateful for, which brings us closer to what the Board of Supervisors is doing with their staffing uh, to get us uh, aligned with our, our goals. Um, uh, Ms. Tolan and I have been talking to staff about there might be a, a classification issue with some of the um, uh, positions here. And so that's something that she and I are working on with Mr. Moss and um, uh, when we have some clarity, um, we'll, be, we'll be sure to bring it back around. Um, another thing that we've talked about um, as, it, as it goes with JET is somebody within the facilities department that would be responsible for making sure that all of the different elements uh, of work within facilities that uh, relate to the JET goals, whether it's in transportations, facilities, energy, et cetera, um, are moving in the right direction. 
Um, we have a JET meeting coming up, and I know a lot of these pieces are going to be discussed. So hopefully we'll be able to um, get some clarity on the JET funding questions. Um, this is something that has been in formation for, for many months. So it's good to see it in here. Um, we just need to make sure that it's uh, everything's classified properly. So that's it for now. I'll have a go back. Ms. McLaughlin. Thank you. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm at a loss at, at where we are. Um, I, I've, I've said over and over again, one of the things that's so important to me is that I have to have data to understand how I can support something. And I know Ms. Burden is, is giving a presentation with a lot of information. She's trying to create time for the board to talk. But I was furiously trying to take notes as she's, you know, trying to explain what feels like a lot of new information. And we're weeks away from voting on this. And I feel like a broken record when I say there is nothing more concerning to me as a board member than to be weeks away from making an important decision on a over $3 billion budget. And I feel like now we're at a race to be trying to sort through some pretty weighty topics. We've got a lot of people in the room. I appreciate our employee associations who are here. Ms. Burden, I don't recall if you were with us during the Karen Garza era, but she, I mean, we spent all this time and money to do an analysis of our compensation for our employees. And Karen Garza helped our board understand that to be competitive, we couldn't elongate our steps um, compared to Arlington to pay our teachers and they wouldn't reach their max earnings until 20 plus years into their career. So we agreed to front load it and it was going to compress the steps because we we're gonna start paying people larger amounts per step. To sit in this meeting and now being told that the data analysis or the overall analysis from your team, Dr. Braybrand, is we're measuring ourselves against the actual numbers of steps, like it's, it's not information in context. Uh, my heart rate is jumping right now and it's probably coming through in my voice and my tone. Um, my colleagues, I, this is what I was afraid of I expressed this and, um, you know, I, there are so many questions swirling in my head from this list, not to mention, of course, you know, many of us have been advocates on middle school start times to see a $54 million price tag there again. When I know the prior leader before Mr. Plattenberg told our community for decades it would cost $40 million for high school start times. Then it was going to be 20. Mr. Plattenberg and, and Karen Garza made it happen for $5 million in the starting year, and I think $2.5 million after that. So, yeah, this, this feels also like a shocker that um, we're still talking about a $54 million price tag. And, you know, in the end, um, there's a lot here that I'm going to really struggle to support. <laughs> Because especially the thing like adding on scales, that's not something we just do all of a sudden three weeks before we vote on a budget and we're going into collective bargaining and the team didn't provide us any data analysis that says we have to do this in order to, you know, like it's just a statement. It. It's no, not data or information. So. Ms. McLaughlin, can we get some reaction to your questions? Oh, of course. Yeah. yeah. Mr. McDonald, do you have anything you'd like to talk about regarding the steps? Can I? Or can I jump in first? Um, Ms. McLaughlin, um, it just got posted this morning, but there is a companion document to the PowerPoint that essentially provides everything, more detail, and everything that I just said. I don't know if you. Oh, I'm, I'm reading it. I looked at it. It's not. It's that's. It's it's like a few sentences per little breakout. That's not going to help me any further than your PowerPoint. I, I read them both, yeah. Well, I'm sorry that you're disappointed. I'm sorry you're disappointed too, Ms. McLaughlin. Let me share a couple things um, on this budget. One, I, I feel what we did working with the, the chair and vice chair is we passed a follow-on motion that identified board priorities that um, were still not present in my proposed budget in January. 
Uh, and we've spent time working together um, over the last few months to prioritize as many of those priorities moving forward. Let me take a couple of things you brought up and share, even for the awareness of other board members too. Middle school start times I know is a priority for some board members. We're 170 bus drivers short under current operating capacity now. And Jeff, Jeff Plattenberg's current best thinking about how to do it involves hiring another 350 drivers. We just don't have the labor market to match the strategic vision of later start times at this time, let alone the additional financial investment. We've got to figure out a way, and I don't know if there is one because Dr. Garza and Jeff took the one variable that there was, which was the time lag in the bus runs. Bus drivers, part of why it's so hard now to want to be a bus driver, there's no more slack in the time. So we're down 150 in drivers. Our proposal requires us to add drivers, and it also requires us to change school start times, which is a very contentious issue after two years of a pandemic trying to move forward with the, the community. I didn't believe it was in our best interest to make any changes. Uh, and even if we wanted to, we didn't have the money, or frankly, even if we have the money, um, and we, were, we didn't have 54 million, we're talking 12 here, we don't have the bodies to make it happen. The step increase is a fascinating thing of what's going on around the market. First of all, the county did do for selected uniform personnel an additional step. We did, this board successfully moved compensation earlier into the product life cycle of, of career earnings. So our employees are getting to career max earlier. But we're also challenged at the end where employees can say, I've got my 25 in Fairfax County and I can go. Why should I stay? I'm getting flatlined on my salary. 10% of our staff, 10% of our staff is at that flatline moment. Even for the Virginia State, they could leave our division and still work for VRS and continue to get additional state income. So it is a, it is a strategic decision to go, yes, Garza was right, and I agree with Dr. Garza, put the compensation up early. But in this tight market, throwing another step on also gives us a competitive advantage with that 10% of the labor force that now is more freed up to start to say, I can go anywhere. Um, and I just want to share that that was part of the, the decision making the team made when we added that one in. Um, yeah, a retention strategy because they can go and still accumulate additional state retirement and they're capped out here and they're not gonna get additional um, increases uh, for the local retirement. So those are some initial thoughts. Um, I'm sorry you're disappointed, but hopefully we can work together in the next couple of weeks and, and get as much of the board as possible in a place to support the budget. I think we've had a good budget year. We've done this budget without drama and, and done it very collaboratively. And I think a lot of the major priorities are still reflected here in this budget. I do want to clarify something you said. Um, I remember our prior assistant superintendent of HR had noted that a lot of the ways that we were able to keep our teachers is that most jurisdictions aren't going to give you more than 15 years credit coming from somewhere else. So even if they retire and they go to another division, it's not my understanding they're going to come in at 25 years credit and be put on that step. So can you clarify that? So Ms. McLaughlin, yeah. if we can put you on a go back to have that um, answered because it is a... Uh, he's, he's trying to answer the, the, why to do this. I think it's relevant that he didn't capture that part. He's making it sound like they can just go. Why can't he just answer, am I right with what our division has told us or not? I could quickly just say Sean would know the details of where the caps are for each district and it's different for districts. But here's a nugget. On bus drivers in Stafford now, Stafford school system, one of the first in the district. I, I know I, I, I'm giving a nugget though. I don't, the, the teacher one Sean can answer, but I want to give you the nugget. What's going on in the context? Stafford is the first school district in Virginia who's unleashed the cap for bus drivers. So a new thing to attract employees is to say, and in the past in Fairfax, we did cap your teaching experience. But even that now is coming under pressure to be more flexible, to be able to attract talent. Because of the shortage increasing, schools are now fighting and cannibalizing each other. 
And so we've got to continue to keep that in mind. And actually, this additional step on the scale is a way to tell our employees at the top to stay with us, to hang with us, and to stay a part of the FCPS family. Sean, anything specific, though, on the teacher steps? I, I don't know the dynamics of that as closely as I know you do. Yeah, I think, sorry, I uh, would say that you captured the current sentiment in the market uh, very well and that the thinking is evolving. And so many school districts are reviewing whether or not a, a cap step is the right approach um, as they're looking at their critical needs and being able to identify ways to recruit talent. So our current practice is to, to cap it, our current practice is to cap at 15 years of service credit for our teachers, um, but ultimately uh, as school districts are, are making those reviews and, and making changes, uh, we're getting updates. Uh, I get updates as part of my conversations uh, with the other region for HR directors. We meet on a monthly basis, um, and that's information that we can continue to review and uh, share with senior leadership. So no caps right now exist that we know of in the Wavy schools. Have no no caps have been waived. It's just conversation. I'm not aware of any changes this fiscal year. We'll give you a go back, um, and part of that go back should clarify about the ability when they leave to collect their their retirement. Okay. So, Ms. Marin, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, I would like to follow up on just the general topic of staffing and retention because that is our greatest investment and what powers our schools. You know, I think that this is, I have a lot of questions over the year and the years about staff formulas and particularly the ESSER funding relation, and, but really just with staffing formulas and knowing how principals seem to constantly be in this space where they got to trade staff. And, you know, I, this is one of those things I think the board could really tackle for like spend a good year or more with the staff and really say like let's get this right and figure out the salary scales as a means of retention and a high quality. So, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm hesitant to dive into all these, you know, I'm, I'm learning about the salary scales the way you're presenting them today and I'm not up for yet delving in because I think it's part of a much larger conversation and something that I really want to work on. Um, the same thing with middle school start times. You know, I think that's a huge endeavor and we need to clear the, the, the you know, the, the, the plates here if we're going to jump into that. Um, I do want to make a connection, though, between a few things that I'm, I'm really concerned that the professional development time is going down because we talked about that a lot, as well as the planning time for elementary school students. And this intercepts with something else I've been talking about with parents around serving kids, whether they're special ed or they're 2E identified or not, and just you know the need for smaller learning communities, the need for more planning time. Like All these things are kind of coalescing for me. And so I just wanted to share that with my colleagues so you know where I'm at. But the, the question that, that leads me into um, for staff is, so the $10 million that's getting transferred back or staying with the county, so we have that net of $12 million that you, you know, smartly reserved, but why not just fill that missing $10 million from that twelve? Why put it back into those four strategic areas for needed investments? But... You know, understanding that correctly, like there's 10 million that we thought was going to come to us that's now not, and that was all a line item for PD. And now, when you broke it down, there were, you know, four, you know, with the four strategic goals, you know, with the 12 million you're saying is available. Um, this is, you know, slide uh, four. Why not just keep all that, most of that 12 million in that first line item for PD? I guess I'm not making sense because you're. Miss Marin, let me try. You got it? Okay. And then, so here, okay. Okay. here's PD. PD is still front and center in this budget. We took one day off of the three days. One day off the three days because of the budget cut. We have in our calendar, as we shared with the board a few weeks ago in the community, EAD is now following, uh, uh, following next year on a Friday, falling on a Friday, not a Saturday. That's going to be a professional work day. Okay, so we're going to actually have an additional professional work day that we didn't have before. The, the, the second day before um, school starts, that money is going to fund the elementary professional development and planning time. Okay, that is what I was talking about at that work session before about hiring monitors to be able to provide planning and professional development equal to what 
or close to equal to what middle and high school provide by letting those monitors go out during recess time so elementary teachers can stay in and have professional development and um, have planning time, of which they're going to need more than ever because of our literacy action plan, our early access to literacy plan. So the bottom line is professional development is still strongly in the budget. We'll still have one additional day before the calendar year starts for professional development. We'll have the second day in April during that Eid observance. And one of the days is being directed to elementary schools throughout the year for additional professional development and planning time. Okay, thank you. But with that 10 million still in, would it have actually been four days? Like three actual days it plus could have one been, spread out? It, it could have been, but our elementary principals really, really advocated that we needed this professional development and planning time issue fixed. The total number of minutes at elementary school for planning time doesn't meet and has it for no, 10, 15 years. I guess I'm, it, it just seems like a simple math equation to me, right? I mean, we had, you were proposing three full days plus yep. the one sprinkled out for planning time. Yep. Now you're proposing two full days right. plus the one sprinkled out. That's correct. So I'm using all my time on this question. Yep. But like, I, I don't really understand that. Maybe another colleague or someone could speak to it, but I just don't understand why we wouldn't just put that 10 million right back in to keep that full day. That's what you said was best. Now we're down a day. Of, 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 of the three days, one we cut, no, I, the second we distributed to elementary, yeah, I, and we <laughs> caught the second one back up as a whole day by having it during the Eid observance in April. So, so we did two of the three, know, put, and, and the third one got redistributed put, to elementary. But putting it on a religious observance day to me isn't like really a, okay. a full on, and we're still down a day. Okay. Um, the two, I would like to hear more about that. The two other things, one is safe routes to schools. That seems to still be operating at the same level of a half time, and Nolan and I and Crawfish have talked more about bumping that up. So I'm curious as to why that is still there. Can you explain that? And then finally, one minute, the the slides 14 and 15 on Jet like be still my heart. I love that we have two slides in there about environmental ed and sustainability. But um, what are the two get to green positions? Because I know Donna Volkman had helped us create a, a plan. I just wasn't sure if someone could explain on slide 15 what those two positions are. Thank you. And do you want to go? Ms. Folkman, do you want to talk about the two positions? Sorry. Hi, I'm Donna Volkman. I'm the Ed Specialist for Get to Green. Um, the two positions are Program Manager, which would manage, do you want me to go through what they would do? or? Um, I know what it is, but... Okay, they're going to manage the Get to Green staff and the budget and ISD, collaborate with the Get to Green coordinator in facilities. Um, this, this position is actually equivalent to what we already have as the program manager in facilities. Um, facilitate the equitable, equitable expansion of the Get to Green program um, through curriculum integration, student engagement, SEL, and portrait of a graduate. So they would be basically looking forward and planning for what our hope is to have those resource teachers um, that they would be planning for that expansion. Uh, the Get to Green Support Specialist is something that we had asked for hopefully in the uh, fiscal year 2020 budget and then it got cut. Um, we currently pay somebody hourly to do that part and that's the Garden Specialist, Outdoor Learning Specialist who goes out to our schools and gives them support um, helping with grants that we might have, how they're expanding their outdoor learning spaces. Um, they would work with food nutrition services on farm to school programs, um, support our division wide programs when we do recycling challenges and things like that, um, and serve as a mentor for those leaders at the school level. Fabulous, thank you. So uh, the safe routes to school, maybe I can answer. Um, I know. Mr. Plattenberg, do you want to talk about that safe routes to school position or? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I can. Thank you for reminding me. 
Um, you know, it's a good question about the Safe Route to Schools because it is the continuance of the funding at the level that was uh, prior. Um, the expansion of that program, the desire to have that program expanded, and uh, requesting that that be more of a full-time was a part of the initial request. Um, like Mr. Frisch's initial comment about matching up with the county, um, when you take a look at our whole plan phasing initially, it's to get the door open so that we can get the proper makeup of all of this office. So um, it is required that in the future that it will be a full-time, that it has been the desire of this body. Um, but we felt by, by going through and identifying the pieces that are included in this proposal that we're covering a broad depth. The instructional capacity that Donna just spoke about uh, so eloquently uh, was one of the key initiatives as well. It was just a matter of how much we can go ahead and do it one time. So I hope that helps. Thank you. Thank you. Or Jane Cohen. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Um, you know, of course, I would be remiss if I didn't start out with big, huge smiles about um, Berg School and the sensory spaces. And thank you so much. I know I've been a massive pain in the butt um, about it, and I appreciate rewarding my annoyance with such a thing. So uh, that's just good news to me that it works to stay after you about it. So bad news for you. Um, and I'd really like to see that as a good model for how we do it in a lot of our programs um, and having some conversations with Key and Kilmer as well. I do remain concerned um, just generally about um, the schools where we're ending, I mean, we're ending restraint and seclusion everywhere, but how we have implemented that on a staffing level. And I know Mr. McDonald and I had an opportunity last week to talk. I really appreciated that conversation. Um, but just if we're going to use somebody like Ross Green as a, someone who's coming in and looking at programs and how we can change, then I hope what we'll do is go to school, no pun intended, on the kind of support that's recommended to institute those changes. So I still remain concerned that we're making changes where you need physical bodies, more physical bodies um, than we do currently have. Um, and even though those schools are staffed a bit differently, I would still argue that they are not staffed in the way that we need to have them staffed to fully support our students. Um, you know, I guess I would love a conversation about transportation, if you guys don't mind walking me back there, and maybe you, Mr. Smith. Um, talk to us a little bit about what was the group that came together and what were their suggestions about what happened with transportation? So, and I think many of the board are aware of some of the recommendations that came from uh, individual members of the task force. Uh, the major recommendation from the task force was to agree upon a new scale. Uh, there were multiple scales that we reviewed, and uh, the, the one thing that, that uh, we agreed upon was uh, the scale uh, where we were at 105% at the midpoint. Uh, there were some discussions around implementation of the scale, and so we uh, took the work back to our senior leadership team with a recommendation from the task force uh, to actually implement those individuals who were compressed at the beginning of the scale, to separate them out and place them where they would have been prior to uh, some of the adjustments that we made at the beginning of this year. Uh, when we had the discussion with our senior leadership team, uh, we felt that it was important to follow our current guidance uh, for how we move individuals from one scale to another. Uh, so uh, by doing so, it's, it's much less uh, of an, a cost or an expenditure for us, uh, and we still get to that 105% uh, at the midpoint, which again was agreed upon by the, the work group. I will say that uh, Mr. M McDonald uh, led the work group. We had uh, representation from um, uh, across all departments uh, to provide input to that group. Um, that I've uh, really enjoyed working with that particular group. I've had some good interactions uh, this, these past couple of years with work groups uh, because I think that our work has been fueled by uh, wanting to actually move through the pandemic. Uh, but the recommendation uh, from the work group was at uh, a higher cost because there was a difference in how we would move individuals from one scale to the next. And what does that mean, though, for individual drivers? So their recommendation was like five percent or, or five million that you're coming in at 1.3 where's the difference then in what it means for an individual bus driver 
So what that means for the drivers who are at the first five steps of the scale, and I'm going to ask Mr. McDonald to help me out if, if I need some help here, but for those bus driver, those drivers who were compressed at the beginning of the scale, uh, when we implement the new scale as a group, they will move together to the next step uh, versus separating them out and moving them back to where they would have been prior to making changes at the beginning of this year. So if you were on step two, uh, you would move to the new scale at step two versus everyone being compressed uh, together and moved uh, to the next highest step. And so just for us and for the public, um, was it just a financial piece? I guess my concern is we know right now we're like 176 drivers short. And we know if we don't have drive, we can build the best school system on the planet, which I give you all a lot of credit for doing. But if we can't get kids there, we are in a bad way. And my worry is that Stafford, who's now not capping and offering 43 bucks an hour, you know, I recognize this is a game between different schools. As you said, I think that's a fair way to talk about how cannibalizing each other's work staff. But if we cannot, I, my fear that I live with every morning is that we wake up and like we cannot get our kids to school and we're having to send the kinds of messages that we did on Good Friday to say like, eh, you know, like we'll be there, but we just need you to know that, that this is gonna happen. And I think parents' patience with that and their ability with their jobs as they lose more and more flexibility from being able to work at home and those like, we have got to shore up our bus drivers and make sure they are getting there. And I'm not sure this is as creative, no, no disrespect intended. I think this is gonna take some crazy out the box thing and 1.3 to me does not seem like that's gonna do that. So, so I, I do think that this is a, a first step and we could have certainly have more conversations down the road. One of the things, the things that we did do, and I know that Ms. McLaughlin talked earlier about data, we looked at uh, our uh, separations for bus drivers over the past five years and we've noted that our separations aren't much higher than they have been over the past five years. Uh, so while we've been talking about drivers going to Stafford and going to other systems, uh, when we look at the data, we haven't seen that happening. So we are, I, mean, I have the same fears that you do, but we are hopeful that by putting some of these changes in place that those drivers who were thinking about possibly moving would, would continue to stay with us. But again, our data didn't show that we've seen uh, a mass exodus from Fairfax County to Stafford or other systems uh, in this past year. So the, the work that we've been doing to recruit drivers has worked for us and uh, we haven't seen people leaving the system for other systems and we're hopeful that this increase uh, will encourage those to stay so that we can continue the conversation. Ms. Amesh. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I do want to thank staff. I know this was a, a tremendous effort of trying to uh, bring everything together after what we had requested in our follow-on, um, and especially want to point out things like JET, the sensory rooms, the telehealth, obviously, will make a big difference for students as we develop that, um, and then the family liaison piece as well, which I think has been long overdue, but is really a pleasure to be able to see this reflected. Um, I did just have a couple of questions. Uh, in terms of the, the where we landed with the bus drivers and the food nutrition staff and whatnot, um, it is my understanding that there was some compromise achieved, but perhaps we weren't able to meet that fully here. Can somebody walk me through a little bit more? I think with food nutrition staff specifically, a professional a professional development day uh, could you know be helpful. Or um, my understanding is from five or five some million of what the compromise was landing with transportation staff that we landed much lower. So can someone just speak through a little bit more that process and what the ultimate compromise was and how we landed where we are uh, deviating from that today? Well, I don't think there was any real compromise. I think that there was a recommendation from the task force. Uh, the recommendation from the task force was about a $5.4 million expenditure. We had that conversation looking at data, looking at our uh, again, uh, the, those drivers who have left the system 
and made some decisions based on the overall budget picture. So uh, the, there was no real compromise. Uh, we did work with the task force uh, and um, shared with the entire group uh, what exactly we would be sharing with senior leadership and then had to make some decisions about uh, what that recommendation would be to the board moving forward. Uh, and then with regard to food nutrition service workers, our conversations uh, were mainly through the task force with uh, our transportation drivers and, uh, and bus drivers in particular, uh, so we didn't have any conversations around our food and nutrition service workers. Uh, my understanding is that recommendations weren't shared with the working group ultimately. I'm concerned about... No, I will, I will, I will, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but we did share the recommendation with the working group uh, of what we were going to share with the superintendent, uh, and, but, but we did not share that final recommendation as we were preparing for our presentation today uh, with the work group, but we did share uh, the entire presentation that I believe was shared with many board members uh, of exactly what we would share with the, the superintendent. Did the budget chair and vice chair get that? Uh, we did not share that oh. with the board, but I do know that the board members have asked me questions about uh, an email that was sent from members of the, the work group itself. Okay, this is so not... Can I oh, just clarify? Um, so, because somebody just asked, did the budget chair and vice chair get this? No, we did not get um, a detailed response to the email that was sent around. I guess that was sent to... Some, a response was provided. But I want to make sure people know what you see here is what we received as and was posted. So it's not something that this chair or vice chair right. was trying to keep. No, from no of course. No. So uh, again, I, I was made aware from, from board members that there were questions about the recommendation. We provided the presentation to the work group on the recommendation that we were going to make to senior leadership, uh, which outlined uh, the $5.4 million recommendation, which is what the work group recommended. Uh, and then we also shared that there was another approach, uh, which was the $1.3 million approach that you see here in the budget. Um, uh, we did not share the final recommendation with the work group that you see here today, but we did prior to making uh, that decision as senior leadership share the full presentation with the work group of what we would be sharing with the superintendent and his leadership team. Ms. Omesh, if I could just add to what Mr. Smith said. Agreement on the scale, that's big. And remember five years ago, um, right as I came back on, Dr. Garza was looking at all the market scale competition. We were developing the scales. And in that first year of the budget, we moved all of our employees, all of our instructional and all of our um, non-instructional employees over to those new scales that were now market scales. So we went back with this transportation group. We've done a new scale. There's agreement on the scale, right? That, uh, hang tight. There's agreement. <laughs> That's yeah. why I'm doing this, because I know you're not satisfied with, the, with our dialogue yet, and I want to help just understand what the issue is. The issue of five million to one million is placement on the scale. The way we placed everybody five years ago on the scale was to go over to the scale, find where your current salary is, and go up to the next highest with at least 2%, okay? The many on the committee wanted to be placed onto that new scale with their current step to be moved over based on their step, step to step, right. okay? That's the difference between the one and a half or 1.2 and the $5 million. Right. So right. I just wanna say that's what the scale, there's agreement on how to be placed on the scale and as, as Ms. Burden and Mr. Smith said earlier, this year, this year, the total change in transportation pay will be about 8.5%. Over the last two years, I think the number will be, uh, was it 14.38%. Uh, so we really have been moving the needle on m making adjustments to the salary um, for our transportation drivers because just as Laura Jane Cohen said, I mean, if we don't have drivers, we're dead in the water. Um, but the part I think where the um, disagreement is, is how to place on the scale, place by your current step onto the scale or place to the next level of step equal to your salary plus at least no, 2%. No, that's exactly, no, that's exactly right, but oh, go ahead, Marty. 
Oh, no, I, I wanted to apologize to you publicly for cutting you off earlier. I didn't mean, I, oh. mean to do that. No, no, and this is not a gotcha. I'm trying to think through how we might end up somewhere better than where we are. Um, I, I guess, you know, the, 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 that's the problem of the placement, exactly, because this was meant to, I guess, adjust for a mistake or an oversight from before, right, where folks felt like they weren't increased where they should be. So it, it, again, we had a active conversations in the work group over four sessions, and and that was part of the conversation. Uh, there there was agreement on the scale, but there was um, again good robust discussion about how that placement should occur. Right, right for existing employees. Right, that's the piece I'm invested in right now because it it relates to kind of what we projected months back in trying to deal with the summer situation. Right. Um, so is there room at all to, to look at this? I, I know one to five is, is a jump, but it, it, to me it seems like a, a kind of backtracking a little bit on a public commitment that was made. So, so there is, a, a, again, as we look at the overall budget picture, we would have to find those additional dollars within the current budget presentation that Ms. Burden presented. What we didn't want to do was to put the board in a position of bringing two recommendations to the board to have you hash that out, and again, to, to, to force you into a decision. Uh, we brought a, a recommendation based on all the information that we had available to us, and again, looking at some of that retention data on one end, because that was one of the major concerns about uh, the, in, ensuring that we were retaining those drivers so that they were not moving to other jurisdictions. Uh, it's also important to note that when you leave Fairfax County, depending on where you are on the scale, you're, you would be leaving our local uh, FSERS retirement system, and you would have to then vest in VRS before you are eligible for their retirement plans. And so uh, that's another thing for our, our drivers to think about. In, in leaving for one higher salary, it's also important for, for our drivers and all employees who are leaving uh, our unique retirement plans here to think about what they might end up losing at the end of the day um, by not staying with Fairfax County, which is, again, another very strong retention tool for us. Yeah, but I think putting them in an impossible situation is different than, you know, caring culture and, and, and recognizing where they're coming from with that argument, right? I think that's where I think there might be room to work through this or, or give it some thought. Five to one is uh, pretty drastic. Well, what I'd say is these work sessions, this is the board's budget at the end, right? I, we, propo we propose, I propose, um, you all gave follow-ons, we brought our best thinking, and that's part of what this work session is, and, and uh, helping uh, say, yes, I think you've got it, or you're off by just a skosh, or something's missing, or it needs to tweak. Um, and so we'll look forward to listening to the rest of the conversation this afternoon. Yeah, perhaps the, you know colleagues who might agree with this can communicate that as well. Um, I think the you know moving the idea was we would take whatever developed from the working group, and I think that would have been a great negotiation opportunity with the community to arrive at a win-win. Maybe we can meet in the middle. So I'm communicating that that's something I'd like to look at, which brings me actually to another bus driver problem. I think it was incredible uh, last week to see that we had delays of 30 minutes, 45 minutes, an hour because we didn't honor a religious accommodation uh, on that day. Um, so I, I did want to ask about this professional development day that's scheduled on Eid for next year. Uh, be, I'd like for us to reconsider that or at least to provide an alternative to compensate, to find a solution, because that was obviously a mistake, not of anyone's fault, uh, really, but um, in, in formulating our calendar last time around. Can somebody speak to that? Well, as you know, we got information that um, that um, you're, you're 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 talking about you're talking about this year. No. You're talking about the calendar for next year. So when you answered a question, you said there were three professional development days, one of which is scheduled on Eid uh, next year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. We're going to add you to a go back. Yeah, yeah. I just wanted and, to respond. And just to this. real quick, we in the calendar next year, one of the the Jewish High Holy Days is a professional development day. We still wanted to preserve our focus on professional development. Um, we didn't plan, we didn't have time to plan the 180 day calendar with that one uh, factored in because it changed, as you know, you helped us know it changed. Um, so again, 
what we constantly do, and this is what you all have to do, and I have to do it and ultimately bring, it's a balancing act. So we ended up doing one of the days as a professional development day, similar to how we did the Jewish two high holy days that um, we have. And a couple of other districts did With it that way. With the holiday. <laughs> a couple <laughs> of the other districts did it that way. A couple made it the full day off. But we were still trying to keep some of this focus on professional development through our budget process. And that was why we did what we did. But I, I certainly understand your point, and we'll keep looking at that. I don't think long term, obviously, this board is committed to honoring all of those days, including um, Eid. And, uh, you know, we'll have to look at what the right distribution is going forward, um, you know, beyond this year, whether the PD days are, 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 are a good way or not. We, 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 we threw that out already, as we did the Jewish High Holy Days. One day is a day off. One is a professional development day for staff. Um, and we'll just have to evaluate that each year. And the board has asked us to come back with a plan next year for the calendar as well. I know that's my time, but Thanks. I'll take a go back. Thank you. Ms. Seismerheiser. Thank you. And um, just to follow up on the transportation question, from my understanding, and I haven't had a chance to talk to you about this in more detail, but what my understanding is that what the dilemma you're dealing with is the step number versus the percent pay increase, correct, by adjusting their salaries. That, you know, it, it changes their step number, but they're still increasing the pay to be 105% of the surrounding jurisdictions. Can you talk a little bit about your um, thinking around how that change may impact sort of the, you know, the social emotional or the mentality of our bus drivers seeing that they're on step two or three when there's 20 steps? Was that part of the conversation? And, and if so, what was the thinking around that? So that is correct. Ultimately, uh, moving to the recommended plan does uh, allow for our drivers to uh, experience an increase in their salary. Uh, perhaps uh, not as great a, a, an increase as uh, moving to the five plus million dollar plan. We did have extensive conversation in the work group over the four sessions around uh, what that impact uh, would be from a, a, a cost perspective, but we also did talk about the, um, the reflections of, of members of the committee, especially uh, folks representing our employee groups um, as part of that conversation around how they they themselves might perceive uh, that movement, uh, and, and they were very clear to articulate that uh, step number is important for folks, uh, and so they, they did articulate the fact that uh, it might be perceived um, uh, not, in, and not, in a, not fully celebrating the fact that folks are, are moving or advancing in their salary because of the fact that their step number uh, in some cases may go down. Um, with the, the planned imp uh, implementation methodology. Again, their pay would increase, mm -hmm. but the step number itself may uh, be one lower or two lower from where they're at now. Did you want, I'm sorry, Ms. Simpson. Is it, if I could, Ms. Sizemar, can I share one more thing just historically for 30 years as I'm walking away from this? The culture in education is my step. My step is my year. Let me tell you something, over 30 years, I got here, I got here, on the same step with people who were frozen for three years right in the early 90s when the recession hit. They stayed frozen, I, I think frankly, I think they stayed frozen for maybe 20 years until we moved everybody over. Prince William right now is doing its own market analysis. They're finding that they're under market for lower paying teachers and they're over market for teachers at the center. They have a new step scale right now um, that's going to try to, frankly, compete with us to get compensation earlier. But people are upset if you go read the news, just this last week's news, because their step is changing. So this is one of these labor force things in education that the step carries, in a sense, sometimes greater identity than, hey, well, what's really happening with pay? And pays up 8% this year. And if you adopt the plan that we've, we've recommended, it'll be up over 14% for two years. So I think that's just an important part as we even do our messaging. Is it talking about the step or is it talking about the overall rate of pay increase as we do our market um, adjustments? And I think what Dr. Garza brought to the board was a strategic focus in looking at the market. Minimum, maximum, midpoint, where are we? And what this task force did that Marty led is agreeing and Sean led is moving that midpoint to the 105%. 
We need to be more aggressive in the market. We need to be more aggressive in the market because the market is changing. Um, and, you know, ultimately the board will decide what it wants. We can continue to look at the issue of what you, what you do once you're over on the scale, but here's what's complicated. Because people all the way through 30 years ago, wait, I got frozen 10 years ago. I got frozen 20 years ago. And how do you untangle, and there are people, honestly, because I remember, who are still sore, you got to come in the year that the, I'm on with three other steps. How come you got that? And, 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 and I, I don't know that we can solve all of those unfrozen steps. That's one of the challenges, I think, in the culture of an education system built on steps. So that was actually going to be my question is the, you know, the, it's a salary increase even though the step may change. Is the salary increase all the way through every step? Is that correct in the same percentage increase through every step? It is an increase for every step. The percentage increase may vary and that's based upon the scale design in terms of meeting the, the midpoint. But yes, everyone would see an increase. And so if you're reduced, let's say, let's you're step five and you're going down to step two, you now potentially would have a chance, and I may be misunderstanding this, of having greater salary at the higher steps because of the salary increase, and you have more chances to get to higher steps. You would than have, you had, so you won't be frozen at the higher level is what I'm trying to get at. You would have more earning potential. Okay, so, so that's what, so even though now in the immediate you're going down to a lower step, you, ha you are not necessarily gonna face being frozen as early as you might have sooner. That's correct, right? So that's maybe the selling point, right? To say not only are you getting a pay raise now, but you have the potential to continue to earn steps beyond what you would have now, if I'm understanding this correctly. Okay. All right. Thank you. I just, and I apologize I didn't have a chance to ask you about that. Um, Switching subjects on that piece of it. Um, I love using a PD day for our elementary school um, to have you know, planning time throughout the year. I think that's phenomenal because I know that's, that's been a real need at elementary school. I did see in the PowerPoint that one of the things that potentially a monitor could be used for is morning meeting. Um, and I just wanted to ask, I'm not sure who the right person to ask is. I do, I'm concerned about that piece of it because I feel like that's a really important social emotional learning time and that's I think really well led by a teacher as opposed to a monitor. I just wanted to ask. I don't know who the right one to answer it for that is. Um, yeah, Sloan, I mean Dr. Presidio or Mr. Noko can Okay, I'll take a stab at it. Hi. Um, so as far as that goes, when we were talking about the flexibility that a monitor would uh, provide to a school, it was never the intention that they would take over all morning meetings. So as a former principal, what I, and I'll just give that as a concrete example, what I would do is maybe one day a week, I would have the monitor doing a morning meeting or maybe doing an afternoon meeting. So the idea would be that it wouldn't be the same across the board or that we are suggesting that morning meetings are done only by monitors, but that there's flexibility within a school. Um, and that would also cover then those other uh, non, those other times that are transitional times or recess as well that frees up for our elementary colleagues. I appreciate that, and um, I appreciate that extra clarity. I, I would just put out that I am concerned. I really believe strongly in what we do in our morning meetings for our students, having gone to observe them in our classrooms. I think there's a lot of good education and engagement happening there. So I will just put my concern that I, I totally want to make sure we use our monitors to give our teachers as much planning time as we can. I would just put my concern that that period, I think, is super important. And so... Um, I would just urge us to really be careful. The other question I have is I know given with COVID and everything that's been going on this year, we've had to pull, principals have had to get creative in pulling staff to, to cover classes. Would that be a role for these monitors? I'm, I don't want to make, I want to make sure that the planning time is protected, right? That the monitors are used for planning time and not getting pulled to cover as subs. Again, I'm not sure who to answer that question, but. So we've currently shared with principals that, and they have monitor funds available to them today that uh, they can use those monitors to fill in where they have needs in their building. And so um, that's the, the course of action today and that would be the course of action for monitors in the future. Are those using ESSER funds or is those one-time funds for those monitors? That's my understanding, correct? Those are, those are ESSER funds, yes. Um, I've heard from some principals the difficulty of hiring monitors. I guess I would ask, um, to look at how we're helping support our principals as well as um, making sure that they're turning to that as a strategy before pulling other staff. And that just is a thought out there. Um, 
And I'll, I know my time's up. I may need to go back. I'll, I'll let you know. Thank you. Ms. Staranak, Kofax. Thank you. And um, thank you all for your hard work on this. So please take this beginning comment in that spirit. Um, our follow-on motion is typically, our, our follow-on motion in my, in my mind was to be where today would be something more of a discussion where we would all prioritize this together. And I feel like priorities were brought to us and I feel like I'm playing extreme game of catch up today, trying to figure this out because there's a lot, there's a lot of changes here. And this presentation just came to us. So I just say that because um, I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about that. Um, I'm not sure what to do about it at that point and I don't wanna lose any more of my time. So I'm gonna ask specific dollar questions about some of the questions my colleagues asked. So when we talk about the transportation scale, with this 8.68%, what is the beginning, mid, and, and hourly weight of our bus drivers? What will that be? So uh, based on the, uh, the, the change, based upon, uh, this is pre-MSA, so this doesn't account for the, the 4%. If that's uh, approved, that would be layered on top of this. So the beginning step would continue to be 2291. Uh, the midpoint would be uh, 2931. And the top of the scale uh, would be, this is uh, layering on that additional step that's also proposed would be 3749. So wait, the first two were not added on, but the third one was? I'm confused. It's the longevity step. Okay, thank you. So those are those three. Um, with the Get to Green initiative, um, do we have a plan for school, uh, of the gardening? Because I love the idea of that. But do we have a plan in that for a school by school, region by region? Because some of my schools have beautiful facilities and courtyards and gardens and some do not. So what's the plan for the gardening? So right now we um, support schools with grant funding because we don't have any specific funding to help schools with the infrastructure. Um, and we mostly do that based on schools that have somebody at their school who's the advocate and will uh, do that work. So our three-year plan moving forward has a region resource teacher for each region to work with the, um, what do we call it, the Get to Green lead at each school. And then it has a stipend for that Get to Green lead at the school. So moving forward, uh, that's our plan, is to try to have more equitable access and the actual infrastructure. So in our three-year plan, it includes the funding um, to help the schools get the infrastructure, plus the stipend for the staff member, plus the resource teacher that will coordinate it all across the pyramids. Okay, yeah, because what you said is the way it operates, and this is no criticism, I'm, I'm liking the plan, but like you said, there had to be an advocate. Correct. There wasn't an advocate, so. Correct. So this will support having an advocate at every school that will receive a stipend and then will receive support from the resource teachers um, to implement. Resource teachers are at, how many of them are there? I'm, I'm not. We're, we're advocating for five, for one for each region. One for each region. Mm -hmm. okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, in, in, in Going back to my initial comment, one thing that I didn't bring up in that follow-on motion because I came, it came to my knowledge afterwards is something I spoke to Dr. Braybrand about. And it is about, um, it really talks about equity. Um, it's an equity thing for our young scholars. We have many schools that do not have, it's the same kind of thing with the gardening, if there, unless there's an advocate. So the, we want to close the equity gap. We want to close the opportunity gap. One way to do this, I was told, were for these um, robotics kits 
and um, algebra conceptual manipulatives. The cost of this would be $468,000. This wasn't something that came to my attention to after the follow-on motion. So does anyone, Dr. Pres uh, Dr. Bray, when I asked you earlier, and you said, Dr. Presidio, do you have any knowledge of this and how we could possibly fund this? I, that's something I want to go back on staff. I want to own, you and I did talk about it, and I double-checked with Sloan. I did not follow, I did not follow up. I take accountability for that. So I need to talk with staff to see. Maybe it could be something we could do at year end to provide those kits um, and make sure that they're distributed, it, it goes well, and we can put it in the budget as ongoing um, with just one-time money to go ahead and get the kits over the summer and still be prepared. But I'll go back with staff, and between now and two weeks from now, um, have a a more satisfying answer about the best approach if, 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 right. if the board feels that's a priority. All right, thank you. Um, and back to you, Dr. Brabran. I think what you were asked, what are other school divisions doing? You were supposed to give us a chart on PD, professional development. Do you, do you have that? We have, we have a chart on, uh, we have a chart on PD that uh, if we haven't provided you, we can. Can you do that? Um, absolutely, and I'll follow up and put it in a Monday uh, the Sloan, did you want to come out? I'll put in a Monday letter. No, that's next what I was Monday. Say. Yeah. Okay. And um, how many electric buses are we getting for the 1.6? Jeff, do you know? Or Marty, do you know? I don't know how many we're getting. We know that there's an add on for uh, electric buses. And so as we think about our normal costs for electric buses, uh, when we need to close the gap uh, uh, for the additional cost for that bus. But I don't know exactly uh, how many we're getting, but we can get that information for you. Okay. Yeah, yeah we'll get it. It's okay. Uh, well, I'll wait because I have one more sec four more seconds. Um, and, of course, I lost my thought here. Um, I'll go for a go back. One thing I would just say, Mr. Anatkov, facts for the first part and, and again continue with improvement I I still and as I'm walking out I think our five years of budget processes have gotten better each year and have saved uh, certainly our collaboration with the county has saved a lot of um, um, we focused more on the needs of kids in the division and still got in the funds we've needed without maybe some additional um, uh, what's the right word um, activity that maybe wasn't always in the best interest of the division or the community so I feel good about that I would say I left with the spirit that the follow-on motion was here are our budget priorities, a list, and do your best to come back as superintendent with your recommendations for these priorities, not the idea that all of them would be able to be funded. Um, and so we took our best stab at it, and if there are things that the board in the end uh, feels don't need to be or need to be tweaked, that that's what we're going to do here, and between now and two weeks from now, we'll make any additional changes, but I do feel good. We spent a lot of time as staff trying to look at as many of these priorities as we could and also look at the uh, direction that we're trying to take the take the division, and we'll be glad to take additional feedback today and between now and the end of the month. And there, there's no doubt that the budget process has improved, and there is no doubt that you've worked hard. I would just say there may have been a miscommunication on what the expectation was um, because I feel as collectively it might have been easier for us to have a lot of this information here and then say these are our priorities. Okay. Um, but Everything I'm, costed and then do it. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. I'll, I'll take a go back. Um, before we move on, um, Mr. McDonald would like to add something. Thank you. And uh, Ms. Derenak Kofax, I would like to apologize. I misspoke around the top end of the scale. Uh -huh. um, the 3749 is reflective of step 19, which currently does exist on our scale. Okay. So if we were to add a 20th step, the top of the scale, again, pre 4% uh, MSA would be 3825. And I'm happy to provide a, a chart that summarizes the min, mid, and max uh, for both the pre and post MSA, if, if you'd like. I, I, I would appreciate that, pre and post. That would, that would be very helpful. And Ms. Whitty, Whitty. Yeah, can Alice, uh, Ms. Willington, share one additional point, please? Um, so um, through um, DEQ, we have been receiving um, our award, and roughly our share for 10 electric buses have fallen 
about 1.6 to 1.7, where um, the grant has provided about 2.3 to 2.4 million. Okay, so of the $4 million it costs to do about 10 buses, our cost share is anywhere from 1.6 to 1.7. Okay, for 10 buses, for that's 10 our buses. cost share, part that's of correct. it, a part of it, thank, mm -hmm. thank you. All right, thank you all. Ms. Pekarski. Okay, um, I'll just say that I actually was under the same impression. I thought today was going to be a priority setting um, for us because I did have you know, I supported the follow-on um, because I know some of those things were important to my colleagues, but um, I didn't know if they were collective priorities. Um, so for whatever that's worth, I know you have all worked so hard to try to get this, um, and I don't want to, you know, I don't, I don't want to um, put that work down in any way. Uh, my questions, I don't really do well just having answers like this out of context. I really would like to see that analysis and that comparison of um, the transportation salary scales with our other school divisions as well and pre and post with what you are um, uh, you know, recommending to us today. I, I just, I have to have that in written form. I, I can't understand it like like this, unfortunately. So I, I appreciate you getting that. Um, thank you. Um, I had a question, something I've been hearing from my, uh, from my schools is that because of reduced enrollment, some schools are losing counselors, which is a real issue for me, um, you know, especially when we're doing some of these other things, knowing where we are right now with mental health. I would have thought that that would be something that we would have held harmless for another year. So if somebody can address that, I, I would appreciate that. So, so I can say that with counselors, we are working with schools and we've provided some resources for and some flexible staffing for counselors. Uh, we do know that in schools where they have lost uh, staffing, at the end of the day, uh, we anticipate having to uh, overstaff counselors in some schools, and so we're working with those buildings who might be losing staff to ensure that they would get to keep those staff um, uh, rather than pull staff out and, and backfill with new staff. So we do have a process as we're focused on counselors uh, and are working with principals individually to help ensure that they're not going to lose those resources. <clears throat> Excuse me, and uh, HR gave the regions a list of each of those schools for the regions to follow up with the principals to work closely to make sure that... <laughs> I know there's been a lot of work done through the staffing reserve, but I know for a fact that, I mean, this is as late as like last week, me having conversations about this, including at my own kid's school. So I don't know where that disconnect is, but there seems to be a disconnect. Um, you know, if we're losing 100 kids, I could understand, but I, I don't think those are the types of numbers we're looking at. Uh, so I don't know what follow-up needs to be done or if this needs to be in some way a budget item, but I feel very strongly that, at, well, I'll put it out to my colleagues that this should be a priority for us. Yeah. And how we do that, I don't know, but we, we, I will definitely follow up um, on that. Okay. Um, can somebody please talk to me a little bit more uh, details on telehealth and the Call Me Mister program. So I can speak to the Call Me Mister program. So uh, we're excited about the possibility of implementing this program uh, that would uh, directly impact our ability to recruit uh, males of color into our teacher ranks. Uh, that is the specific focus of the program. Uh, it's a program that was uh, born out of the um, university or out of Clemson University in South Carolina uh, and is in place in a number of states across the country. Uh, we would utilize this program to conduct the targeted recruitment, support those individuals uh, with uh, part of their tuition, and in exchange uh, for that support, they would provide a commitment to teaching with Fairfax County Public Schools. Uh, we're looking at a, a 
one year tuition support equates to one year of uh, teaching commitment with the school division. Uh, ultimately, uh, this is part of our strategic plan, uh, an area that we want to continue uh, to ensure that we're making significant gains. Uh, we recognize that uh, the number of male teachers doesn't reflect or mirror the Fairfax County population, which is what our, go our goal is. Uh, and we also recognize that uh, there's a need for more people of color uh, to join our teaching ranks. And, and this program uh, helps us toward that end in both areas. I agree. Um, so I wanna understand for this amount of money, how many teachers are we going to be able to recruit? And I guess why this approach, or maybe it's in tandem probably, than our um, you know, teachers that we are, we are looking at our own uh, students to kind of bring up. Sure, it's absolutely in tandem. We, we need to continue to grow our grow your own pipelines. Um, we're gonna continue to stay committed to those initiatives. Um, we're working with Teachers for Tomorrow and being able to help those uh, high school students uh, have a clean and clear pathway to return as teachers to our organization. Uh, we're working on reestablishing a partnership uh, with the university to help our classroom instructional support staff be able to work towards becoming certified as special ed teachers. This program would again uh, help us target and, and, and work a, a different pipeline. Um, so it's, it's kind of a layered approach and we wanna keep all of those uh, layers going. As we continue to see the numbers of uh, uh, students graduating university programs decline. Um, so it's this an opportunity to help bolster um, that overall uh, effort. And just two more, how many teachers and also is there, um, I guess, data where this has been used, its success? Absolutely, so uh, our initial year would be targeting 30 individuals to be enrolled. Uh, and then we would be looking to layer on an additional 30 individuals uh, each of the subsequent years. So at any given time, uh, when, the when the program is up and fully implemented over a four year span, uh, having, I think by mass rate, 120 individuals enrolled at any given time. So was this amount for four years or this would be a recurring? So this amount would uh, is for the, the first year of implementation, so there would be approximately $150,000 increased cost escalation over uh, the next three years uh, to bring us to a $600,000 commitment for tuition alone. So there would be a slight escalation year over year. And, and I can go back. I, I know that, that uh, we shared information with the board, it seems like 10 years ago, uh, at the beginning of the pandemic because this was initially uh, in the budget and we answered a lot of questions about the Call Me Mr. program. Uh, and so we thought that this was an opportunity to bring it back, uh, but, we'll, but we'll- I remember, I just don't remember getting answers to these. <laughs> we'll get the Thank information you. and bring it back. May I add one more thing? I, I, I do know that um, it, essentially we're looking at uh, a $10,000 commitment per individual per year in terms of tuition. So I hope that provides some context. It sounds like a lot of money, but when you think about the money that's expended by the organization to go out and recruit talent otherwise, uh, it, it is a premium. Uh, I, I won't, I won't, uh, I wanna be clear about that in terms of, of what typical costs are, but it, it can cost anywhere between ten and twenty thousand dollars for us to recruit someone uh, through other pathways. Yeah, thank you. I just wanted the details. So before we call on uh, Ms. Keys Gamara, I do want to assure all of my colleagues that um, when we had this discussion on uh, with the recommendations of staff, it's with the full awareness and understanding that we have between now and the end of this month on the 26th for our colleagues to allow us uh, to adjust the num you know the budget allocations based on the priorities of this board and so one of the things that i would urge you to do today you know we've heard some of the questions come up is that at the end of this session that we will kind of reprioritize what's there and whether there are additional um, details that board members need to determine how to um, 
adopt the final budget. Um, I will also suggest that it is quarter of one and at the recommendation of at least one of our board members, um, there's a request that we extend this work session. And so rather than us having the extension of this work session where we all have hungry bellies, I'm going to suggest that we break um, after the first round, allow people the time to eat, and then we'll reconvene a half an hour later. Does that make sense? And if I can get a show of the board's um, willingness to do that, to follow that approach. So I. Two minutes at least for the second go round, but we are not going to have the second go round until after people have uh, taken a break. And so, Ms. Keys Gamara, I know you're on the phone. Um, do you have any questions so far? And you are muted, Ms. Keys Gamara. Here you go. Okay. Now. Thank you. Is that better? Okay. Much better. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for uh, this discussion and uh, putting this presentation together. Uh, I agree with some of my colleagues that uh, we are continuing to evolve and really have um, some more detailed conversations. So I really appreciate that. I will also say a number of my questions have been addressed by my colleagues. Um, I look forward to additional information specifically, uh, more specifically, especially uh, with respect to transportation and our bus drivers and how we might enhance that. Um, I do understand uh, the professional, the loss of the professional day. The one question I, I don't think I heard, and I, I, I apologize if I missed um, uh, the beginning of the meeting and didn't hear it, but on page nine of the presentation, uh, there is a reference to um, difficulty in recruiting uh, certain personnel and where the salary scale extension would go, and it refers to the central office personnel, if I'm reading that correctly. Um, if so, can we identify what central office personnel we would be talking about? I would say specifically. So I would say specifically, uh, when we look at central office, it, it's a, across all of our operations. Uh, we are uh, we have several vacancies in our HR operations, our payroll and finance operations, uh, facilities and transportation, uh, information technology. We see those uh, uh, the, those vacancies across the board. So that's a, a general central office includes uh, a majority of our operations. Okay, so are you looking at support staff in particular or specific roles? Oh, the, 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 there are there are, are, are many different roles. And so when we look at payroll specialists, when we look at procurement specialists, when we look at uh, folks in HR uh, who do uh, very specific work. So it, it is uh, across all of our operations when we look at uh, at having several vacancies with our operating staff and central office staff. So, um, forgive me if I missed it. I did hear uh, Ms. Burton say there was a document posted this morning. I did not get an opportunity to review that. Um, but if we could get, if I would appreciate where where these holes are, where um, the vacancies are occurring, where we're suffering in the in the central office. Um, so that that can be a part of our analysis. And I, I think that's um, what I have right now. Thank you. Certainly. Okay, thank you, Mr. Smith. Thank you, Ms. Keys Gamara. I will take my turn and then uh, Ms. Tolan will take hers. So I think it's gonna be really important for this board to have a chart which shows the histor historical perspective on salaries and salary enhancements by financials for all of our um, transportation staff. Because I think that, as you uh, mentioned, Dr. Brabrand, there has been a focus on steps versus what is actual money in pocket. 
And um, I think that we need to have a better understanding as a board, um, especially as we go into collective bargaining potentially, that um, we have a better understanding is the priority on the step number or is it the priority is on um, money in pocket <coughs> and total benefits. So it, it, could somebody get that to us in a short term, short time frame? Yes, we'll pull some information together. Excellent, because I, it's my understanding that that um, increase just over the past few years has been has exceeded 14 percent, and so I'd like the whole board to see that information. Um, secondly, regarding the professional development, um, especially professional development and planning time, um, I'm very supportive of that, but I also think that we need to have very clear guidance given uh, at the building level as to how that planning time and professional development should be used. And so that would be something I would expect, not as part of the budget process, but as a um, tied to that um, change in perspective. Um, on professional development days, uh, Dr. Brabrand, I'm actually pleased that you did um, reference the um, Jewish holidays as well as the Muslim holidays. My concern is, and we've talked about it, I think that it's a good use of time and it's, it's equitable treatment. However, um, it's how do you actually allow people to use, use that. So for example, if a person, a professional person wants to have, uh, I would like to see that professional day be, uh, both of those days, be um, self-directed to do online learn um, all the online modules so that they can either get that work done on that day or they can actually prioritize and use uh, timing elsewhere but still achieve the professional development piece so that people have that flexibility but then have that mapping of comparison of how we do professional development versus the other jurisdictions. Um, in particular, you know, what is self-directed, what is mandatory by the, or directed by the, um, by the uh, central office. I very much appreciate the discussion on hold harmless for the um, counselors. I too have seen some of the challenges there. What I'd like to understand is whether or not our um, staffing reserve allows for us to um, tap into that for the um, hold harmless for the counselors or if we need additional funding for it. And I will take a go back. Ms. Tolan. I'm happy to follow that in full agreement on your comments around professional development. And um, also had a couple of principals worried about their counselors, but was assured that that was taken care of. So hope that that is exactly what is taking place. So looking forward to more information on that. Um, just wanted to make a couple of comments around the um, the sustainability, the jet dollars that are in here. Um, Mr. Frisch and I have been working with staff, both at the county and at the school district on a, a multi-year plan for this. Um, just so the board is aware, you know, the county has this as a very high priori priority and um, has hired at least nine people um, for this initiative over the last couple of years where we have not hired any staff specifically um, for this work. Um, the big chunk of money that's in there right now is, as it was pointed out, is a um, cost share funding amount for electric buses, and we've got that divvied out over the three-year time frame to allow us to take advantage of DEQ, um, EPA, some very large um, grant opportunities to enhance our electric bus fleet. So that's what that money is for. It's a, like a, a, a multiplier um, for us around that. Uh, one question that I have for staff, and we can follow up on this later, I know the county is moving full force into their work on zero waste and is looking to hire three or four people, and my understanding is over the next year to focus on that, and we don't have anyone on zero waste until the second year of this plan. So uh, not sure if we need to take a second look at that. I um, just want to mention, too, on the safe routes to school, um, Ms. McLaughlin, you know, Mr. Frisch, Ms. Brown, and myself have all been working with, um, you know, our, our Fairfax uh, Biking Association 
and really looking at how do we keep that program going and how do we, uh, you know, a number of us have had conversations around given the transportation issues that we have and the shortage of bus drivers, we are seeing increased numbers of people at schools trying to, trying to walk to school and bike to school, but they're running into issues with, you know, uh, paths that are not maintained, sidewalks that suddenly end. And so I think we really need to look at what we call safe routes or getting people to school safely in a broader interdepartmental way um, with safety. I know Mr. Uh, Vaccarello is working on five or six schools with safety issues around, you know, having people walk to school. So safety, design and construction, I've already had instances where they're not connecting with pathways that are being put together. We need to be proactive and I think in the long run we'll save a lot of money a lot more than the perhaps additional $70,000 we might need to put into this budget to make this a full-time position. So with that, I will close. So ladies and gentlemen, um, if I can suggest it's now 1255, if we could reconvene at 125 and spend um, about an hour more, and if we need more, we'll, we'll deal with it then, okay? Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, as soon as we have one additional person join us in the room, we will have seven at the table and we can reconvene. I'll see if there's anybody in the uh, ante room. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we now have quorum and we will begin. We're slated to have about one hour for this period and at the end what we will do is kind of prioritize what we've ha put on the table today so that we can, uh, both Ms. Tolan and I can move forward with staff and we'll provide you all updates on it. So with that, Mr. Frisch. Thank you. Um, one of the difficulties of being a school board member, oh, timely violence breaking out all over the county, um, is that we're typically only presented with one proposed plan, even if many things have been considered and the pros and cons have been weighed. And so we find ourselves trying to reverse engineer the thinking on something that's been brought to us and wondering what other things were considered and rejected for whatever reason. Um, so with that in mind, uh, and with limited resources and staff support, that is a tall order for school board members, especially when we don't get the materials more than a day or two or a couple more uh, days in advance. So with that in mind, I do wanna dive in a little bit on the pay scale conversation. Um, at this point, many of the Wavy uh, school divisions have posted their proposed budgets for next year. I wonder how our figures compare to those proposed budgets in terms of keeping up. Sorry. 
for the bus driver's salary. So Mr. Frisch, uh, the work, uh, I don't have that analysis to provide, so I wanna be upfront about that. Ultimately, the work group focused on uh, the report that was provided to the board back in January where we conducted a more comprehensive study. As you know, the market conditions continue to evolve, uh, and so I don't have a, a current chart of the, the WABY um, future salaries for the bus drivers to, to give today. All right, I'll make sure that I include that on next steps because I think it's important context for this conversation. What good is it to have this conversation about what we want it to be if we're then outstripped by uh, neighboring jurisdictions? Um, did the employee groups uh, from the working group agree that the $1.3 million uh, scale plan today would help retain drivers? No, the, the, the employee group uh, was very focused on the $5.4 million plan, which was, uh, which was the recommendation that we brought from the employee group. But no, uh, there was a lot of discussion around the $1.3 million, and at the end of the day, the recommendation was the 5.4. And can you walk through the difference between the two? So going back to the difference between the two, it's really about placement on the scale. Uh, it, what the, the task force did agree upon because there were quite a few conversations about the, the scale that we should approach. Uh, different uh, members of the task force brought different scales. Uh, Fairfax County Public School staff, uh, budget staff developed a scale. And so at the end of the day, we did land uh, collectively on the scale itself, that we would be 105% at the midpoint. Uh, the difference is really about placement and how individuals would move from our current scales to the new scale. And then, again, that would be based on current step versus keeping that current step on the new scale or finding your closest salary, which is our current uh, uh, process that we use for moving individuals from one scale to the next, finding your closest salary on the, at the next um, or, or your closest salary amount, it could be at the same step, it could be at a lower step, but you would be making more money. So it, it's the difference of uh, receiving a higher increase because you're moving from your current step to a new step versus just moving to the next highest amount on the scale. And I think the concern was over retention. So if, if about 90% of the non-Fairfax County resident drivers in our system live in only surrounding jurisdictions, with 70% being from, I believe, Prince William and Alexandria, um, why would we continue to use the full WABY if only to lower the discrepancy between pay? Well, so I know that those are questions that were actually brought up in the work group where we talked about uh, actually looking at different uh, comparator districts. And because we use way before uh, so many of our other scales, uh, we continue to use that as uh, a scale for this particular work. It is something that we could look at in the future, but for this work, uh, we do look at our comparators and, and for the, the presentation that we brought to the board, uh, we base that on our wavy districts. Yeah, I just think it'd be more likely they'd go to some place where they live versus someplace that is far away. Um, and with it, it's still hard for us to know where those drivers are going. So we don't necessarily know that just because that's where drivers live, that that's exactly where they're going. To the point about mid-scale, and I know I'm running out of time, so I just want to finish this thought. If a driver on step 10 out of 19 for the current uh, step plan is making $28.04 uh, an hour, and they are moved to step eight in the new plan, they would be making $28.46 uh, an hour because that's the midpoint on the scale. Um, if we judge that by the five surrounding jurisdictions, they would be making the average there in the midpoint on the scale is $30.29. My understanding is that the working group proposal would still not have gotten quite there, but it only been off by a few cents. I think it would have been like $30.21. So the question becomes, is this sufficient for retaining the people we have invested so much money in their skills and everything else when the midpoint is off by several dollars um, for these drivers? Why wouldn't they go to any of these other places where the midpoint is much higher? 
You're talking about thousands of dollars a year, potentially. I mean, this is a figure that could be figured out by staff, I guess. No, so I don't have the answer for that, other than to say that when we look at past experience and when we look at past data in terms of uh, separations from the system, uh, going back to we haven't seen an increase in those separations based on our current environment. And so it's hard for us to know what individuals would do. Uh, I, I think that that's something that we could look at over time to see if uh, moving to the recommendations that the superintendent and senior leadership provided the board, if we did move to that and see that there were uh, uh, drivers who were you know, leaving the system, moving to other jurisdictions, we could certainly come back with different recommendations. But and I'm not trying to be crass, and I'm not trying I, to be I don't think you are. uncaring but for the public, too. I, I think about the public, too, uh, who are listening. Uh, it, it's simply that based on our, the current experience that we have within the system, we aren't seeing large numbers of drivers uh, at our current pay scale, leaving Fairfax County for other jurisdictions. So we are tracking where they're going? Outside of our reten or the um, separations that we've had in the past. So we haven't seen an increase in separations over what we've seen in the past. And we have some data that we can share with the board. Ms. McLaughlin. I was so hoping I might have a better tone in my second go back, so I'm just warning everybody right now, this has been painful. Um, I wanna pick up on something Mr. Frisch said and, and race in two minutes to try and talk about where we're gonna go with a $3 billion plus budget. Um, Mr. Smith, you just said we have some data we can show you about separation and bus drivers, and that's awesome. Scott, what I have said over and over again is this board and the public as in general, we cannot take simply the words of your team and that's how we're going to make decisions. The public expects us to have the data that we can all look at collectively together. This whole meeting has been your, your very well-intentioned team saying a lot of words. There's no charts, there's no data, there's nothing. And without it, I'm not going to just do something because we're being told, well, we did our work and trust us. So that's at the macro level of today's problem. I'm, I would beg my colleagues, we're spending a lot of time talking about a million dollar thing here, another million dollar there. And meanwhile, there's been no discussion about the fact that we have aging infrastructure including anyone who's following Twitter and the, the Woodson baseball fields, their dugouts and their press box are all leaking and well underwater and all those things. And Jeff Plattenberg can tell you he's got tens of millions of dollars of aging infrastructure that go unfunded every single year. Sean McDonald has been a phenomenal acting superintendent of HR, but he probably hears what I'm hearing. We are months sometimes lagging to hire people because he doesn't even have enough staff in there to timely hire, review, and get people into positions. So this conversation has been focused with my one second left on little pieces, and meanwhile, no one's talked about $22 million in professional or the professional development, which, Scott, you promised me we'd have a wavy chart that showed us against all the other divisions and their annual professional development days that they pay out. Where is the chart? We have the chart and I didn't realize it hadn't been shared with the board. I know it had been shared with, with me at one of our cabinet meetings and I'll get it to you. I, I appreciate um, that. I will reiterate for everybody. Anything you're going to talk about with us, it should be posted on board docs so the public can see it, the board can see it, and the board can point to the public and say, this is what we use to help inform our decisions. But everybody, if you vote for this budget in three weeks and we don't do a, a deep dive into professional development days across the division with an extra $22 million that could go to so many other places, I think we have failed. I would just like to say, the, and I appreciate the feedback, the professional development is a theme we've been talking about for a long time before this board. We, we have, and if you, okay, well, I'm just, I didn't interrupt you, and I ask you not to interrupt me, please. Ask teachers, go talk to teachers about professional development. They need the time. 
Now, there's been some discussions about when's best to do the time. One of the days we're going to infuse through the elementary school year using monitors so they can get planning time equal to middle and high. This has been a 15-year problem we're solving it in this budget, which I think is a big deal. I think one of the things here on the bus driver transportation is probably getting at what Carl said, is to try to give you a better view of with what we know right now, where is the scale going to land us in the market competitiveness with bus drivers? It's almost like Goldilocks. Is it too little? Is it too much? Is it just right? And uh, we'll try to work to get you some of the, we will not try, we will get you some of that additional scale information so you can see where we're landing. Again, the committee recommendation was to land at 1.5% of where we were in the market um, as established by Wavy. But I think some of you want to see what, we know that there's, we, we, we know there's divisions beyond Wavy and where are they landing and is it pretty close to where that 1.5 percent, well, 105 percent is, or it's farther away? And 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 just finally, I mean, we all are here to work together. And I, you know, I'm sorry, as some said, you know, I left thinking the follow-on motion was for us to do work and come back and bring you what the proposed priorities were. And I guess that is just another thing for continuous improvement. But. Uh, um, you know, we are working to try to bring you our best thinking and, and bring you as much information. Sometimes we're working up to the last minute because we're working with board members up to the last minute um, and having conversations. And it's 12 of you. It's a lot of folks to uh, work with and, and coordinate and then talk with the chair and vice chair about what should or shouldn't be in the presentation. So, um, you know, I, I, I'll leave you with this, a parting thought. This board does too much and it's got to find less priorities to be able to spend more time on. We're always rushing from one thing to the next, and um, I think that may be one of the things to do. The budget's a big deal, and we can spend more time doing the budget next year um, if that's what you want to do with Dr. Reed. But uh, I'm, I'm pleased with the process we created, and we'll get some information on the scale to help you make some uh, better decisions um, on what your final um, approval will be. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Brabran. Um, I would reiterate that the really the remainder of our time together, we should be focusing on what are the top priorities? Are there things that um, were presented by the superintendent and his team whom we greatly appreciate for the incredible work that you have done in trying to capture the feedback from each and every one of these of our board members? But if we can spend the remainder of this time on looking at what has been presented and saying, you know, where you would like to see more, where you think if we're going to add more to one thing, what would you take away? So that there's more of a, um, a dialogue about our priorities amongst the board members. And so with that, I have uh, Melanie. Sure, thank you. Um, I, I definitely want to keep the priority of the get to green work. Um, the librarians, that, that gives me some pause that we, we know that we need more librarians and it's a big numbered item. I don't have the slide right in front of me, but you know, is there anything we can do um, in those schools that have high um, student membership numbers to get them that additional librarian? We've heard about their value when it comes to instruction. So um, that, that's one thing I wonder, is there some way to, to eke that out? Um, let me just look real quick. And just and, for and, clarification, just yeah. on that one, Ms. Marin, it's a clerical for the libraries versus the librarians okay. themselves. We are fully staffing the one librarian, the two, two places where we don't have a full-time librarian, we are gonna staff that with full librarians. So the, the, bigger, the bigger number was the one about clerical staffing in the libraries. And we're glad if that's your party, but you said librarians. I just want to say we did fund that in the budget to make every school will have a full-time librarian in this budget. Okay. But I thought that there, were, there was some advocacy we had heard that some actually want two librarians because they've got, you know, 800 students. But if that hasn't even been in the works, it doesn't seem like that's going to... We do have a staffing now. formula, though, that triggers when enrollment to get a second librarian, right, Sean? Um, yes, we So did. that was the piece I was wondering is, is there some room to lower that trigger to help those librarians that are in elementary schools with, you know, 700 students. Um, so that was something, but I don't know if that's a, a new thing you haven't all analyzed, but that, that you know, um, triggered my memory of this advocacy that we've heard. 
Um, the other piece, um, you know, I'll just say again, I mean, I think the staffing is, is a big piece. I, I'd like just some more clarity when we talk about prioritizing for this discussion, just what direction are you looking for from the board regarding the steps, the, the salary topics we've been talking today, because there's been a lot shared. I'm not clear what you need from us and what we might need to continue deciding. Well, let me, let me take a crack and then you want to go first? I would just say, so here's what we proposed. It's kind of, I think, what Ms. Corbett Sanders was saying a minute ago. What would you want to take out? If, if, if bus drivers a delta of $4 million, where where would you want us to move $4 million from something else to something else? Um, you know, is professional development important? One board member says you're spending too much money there. Uh, someone said something about counselors and maybe the reserve staffing, giving us some additional uh, direction on what you saw here. We brought you our best work, and of course the board has the final, I mean, you all do approve the budget, and if there's something in here. Um, but it does help instead of staff going back to figure out what 12 people can agree on, what helps in these meetings is knowing, you know, we really like this one, this one maybe go back, maybe we would trim something in this area to be able to do something more over here. That always is, always is helpful. Um, and I think the challenge is we're always trying to balance multiple priorities by multiple stakeholders, including you all, and trying to figure out what, what the consensus is. We don't know till we bring it. Um, and now we're looking for feedback on places where, eh, maybe there's not gonna be consensus there, or there's at least interest to see if there's a way to do more here. And if you have a specific place where it can cut, it makes it makes it easier. Yeah, I mean, just thinking back on the budget cycles I've been a part of, you know, it's hard in this 11th hour to start rejiggering things. And we've had discussions about that. And it's, you know, we have also asked, you know, to understand how it's all made. And that's, you know, we understand that's a, a big process and, and things. But, you know, when I look at where I have a few million dollars to leverage this way or that, I mean, I, I don't think we're going to, yeah. you know, fix, you know, challenges. I, I just do want to say, the professional development to me, the most important thing of these additional recommended, you know, changes or updates is to protect that teacher planning time for elementary schools, hmm. uh, teachers. Um, I had I wanted more, but we have at least got to have that planning time. And, and I would just say on that, that that's like a 15 year thing that elementary principals have wanted. Um, and I'm, I'm excited to see it in there. I do want to say, like on counselors, um, Ms. Pekarsky, just thinking ahead, I haven't talked to the team, but I'm, I'm going to make sausage right here. We can always talk about um, the staffing reserve in one time if we need to relook at the cutoff for one time that just goes for one more year until we think staffing patterns. Our monthly report just came out from Mr. Sethi. We are almost 3,000 kids up since the beginning of this year. Our enrollment continues to see more and more families each month coming in. Um, and we've really been, we have been liberal and progressive with the um, staffing reserve, and I hear advocacy to do that a little bit more on counselors, and we can certainly look at that if that's the will of the board. Yeah, well, thank you. And the last thing I'll say related to counselors and mental health, I've just been getting some emails um, from a particular educator who's you know, getting feedback from students, and there's so many ideas of what kids need, so the telehealth is a great step, but more around those really personal mental health supports for kids. So, <clears throat> One thing on the, the telehealth I just want to share with the board real quick, and I was mentioning it to Brar, who I know has talked about it a lot. Part of the tele, part of the mental health challenge is the mental health professionals. It's scarce. So we are trying to work now with CSB and start to pilot how we can get those personnel to the kids, even though they can't be at the school, and maybe even work on a pilot where during the day the kid can have time during advisory, instead of going to the traditional advisory, they can go and receive telehealth services to that child individually. So some of it is about really scale, and telehealth looks to be one of the best ways we can, in a short term, really do something to give additional services for kids. So I know Michelle's excited to work with the CSB on this. Thank you, Ms. Mayor. And Ms. Cohen? Thank you. And just to piggyback on that, I also think some better training for our advisory teachers about how to be those supports for students if they're the ones that are going to have eyes on our kids for four and then secondary school potentially six years, them being able to know some of how to recognize some things and, and provide those opportunities. Um, I am going to go back, sorry to be a pain, but about bus, bus driver salaries. Um, I agree with Mr. Frisch. I'd like us to see a chart of our five surrounding 
counties a comparison with their proposed budgets because my understanding from our colleagues and other school boards is that this is going to be way out of line with where they're winding up at the end of the year so we feel like we're making a push and we're we're just not getting anywhere um, I looked back at the bus driver the compensation study and looking at the um, the employee movement that we've had um, and how the hiring has lagged behind you know it talks about that the net deficit is is retention six of the past ten years so this is not just a COVID related or great res great resignation related problem this is something that's been um, happening for a long time so I would like to just say to my colleagues if we can figure out some way to work together I'm even understanding of getting from one point something to five point something is huge but is there an opportunity that we could do what we try to do with like our IA salaries that we work to do half this year and half next year in a commitment to get to that 5.3 I mean I just it's not tit for tat right scales impact your retirement in a way um, that and it is maybe it is psychological what Dr. Brabrand's saying that some of it is just but if we're talking about need if we're talking about what what our employees want um, then maybe we need to do a better job of of educating um, ourselves and them I also heard nothing in this budget I'm running out of time food and nutrition if we're still going to be doing free um, breakfast and lunch our food nutrition services people are so overtaxed it's like they're, they're we're driving them into the ground so we either got to add more people or or pay them a lot more to do it I have like 800 things on here so if there's go go backs I would like a go go back and I thank you Ms. Cohen and I would remind everybody that a budget proposal is a snapshot in time of the priorities and that for the first time this board actually got out ahead and identified what the priorities were um, in the budgeting process back in the fall and we incorporated every single one of those in the initial proposal um, we are then tried to accommodate or to have the um, superintendent and his staff address the list of um, items that people had an interest in and um, the challenge we're having now is to make sure we can work within our means but also realize that there are some new big ticket items that are coming up at the table that have not been on either one of the prior um, uh, prior prioritizations of this board so if we want to get a, a idea from the remainder of the from the whole board on those priorities I think that will be important um, at the end of this session and with that I have Ms. Omesh wait can somebody answer my food and nutrition services question sorry yes Um, no, the USDA has not continued free food for all into in, okay. in next fall. Yeah. Yeah. USDA did not extend the free mo meals program. Yes. Uh, so, Ms. Umesh. Thank you. Um, I guess even with that, though, um, I know, uh, at least from the community, I've heard some things on the food and nutrition side. I don't know if there's anything we can do, again, in terms of professional development or whatnot. How much would that cost us? I guess I know there was some, some outcry to incorporate an additional day or um, to extend their contract, et cetera, but I assume there was some thinking around why not to do that. Well, the professional development days that are included in the budget um, are funded for all less than 12 month employees and so that those PD days will provide those additional days for food services as well okay I, I guess there, my understanding was there was some discrepancy in in the adjustments we made for bus drivers as compared to food and nutrition we have included in the superintendent's recommendation one additional day for transportation employees how much would it have cost us to do for food and nutrition uh, I don't know. We'll have to calculate that and get back to you. Okay. I think that would just be helpful to, to know because I know that on the community side, that's being felt right now. Um, so if it's not, if it's inconsequential, 
that might be something to consider folding in, uh, just so that we're not communicating something that's not our intent, as always, to the community. Um, the other thing I, I did want to uh, touch on was the translation piece. I thought that was a huge, uh, I, I obviously, it's a huge opportunity and is a massive dollar amount, just reflects really the extent to which we're behind in this area. Um, but would it, ha have we considered breaking it down? I know, I guess a year ago or, or two years ago, we talked about that with ESOL, right, where it's this massive pie and we're gonna just take bites at it every time. Is that potentially possible here with the translation piece? Or did we, did, was there a reason why we didn't go that route? I, I, I think, I'll, I'll speak for myself and they can share. I think that was something that was shared later. We costed it, I was like, wow, that's a whole lot of money. And yeah. I didn't dig deeper than that. I think we did do some ESSER dollars though around translation. Sure, so did. I'm just saying I, where my head really goes is, how do we build on that for the operating budget? Because next year we need to wrap it up and then go ahead and build maybe a phase plan so that's just the most honest answer. Came a little late and went, well, Esther's got it for now, and maybe we can come up with like a two or three year plan around uh, further translations um, moving forward. Yeah, I think it would be helpful to have something like that that we can look at. I know that, yeah, some of it was reflected in Esther, but so minimal compared to the need that's out there. And, and this is one of those issues where th the urgency comparison is just, uh, to me, it's, um, untenable, you know, when we're trying to add and build and, and develop further, but this is like a major gap, right? There are families who cannot access our system in the ways that others do. Uh, so maybe if we can look into that, I think that would be very helpful to me and seeing, even if it's a small amount relative to the rest of the budget, committing some piece and saying that this is our plan for the subsequent years. I think that would be uh, really helpful. Um, and then, Finally, I, I did just want to harp back in terms of the religious holiday accommodation situation. I know the previous year we, we did fund that. Um, I hope that maybe we can make sure that some of our funds are going to make sure that that cost is not borne by our employees in those situations where we're not able to make that accommodation because I heard complaints about that this year, but I'm just flagging that for consideration. Can, can you explain that one a little bit more funds for, or do you know what she's saying? Because I'm, I'm, I'm not, leave, I'm, tell me. The leave time? whether that counts uh, as part of their regular leave because we failed to offer an accommodation versus religious accommodation leave that is not counted towards their typical hours. So essentially they're paying for it. So the, the way we've structured the, um, the, the opportunity for employees is that they have an opportunity to make that time up um, and we afforded them uh, that opportunity up to, I'm um, believing it's 16 hours. Uh, I don't, I, I think that's- Yeah, yeah, it is, it's 16. So, um, so we, folks do have that opportunity, so they need to work with their supervisors around ensuring that uh, uh, they've communicated the need and ultimately working with the supervisor to determine what work they would complete in order to make up that time. And then on top of that, so we recognize that employees may have more than 16 hours worth of, of uh, religious obligation. And then as they would prioritize other leave that they would need to take, they would incorporate that into other leave that they might have and use. Right, but that ultimately is a cost on the employee that they're bearing, right? As opposed to what we did the first year, I think. It, given that we've, we've identified 16 hours that the employee could make up, uh, but, but I don't remember any conversations where we would close the gap for those individuals to take an unlimited number of uh, days for religious observance and that the system would uh, close that particular gap. Not over that the it's unlimited, hours. but when we'd fail to account, uh, uh, um, plan for it, that they not bear that cost. I think that's what I'm trying to say for next year. I'll work with you offline to, to clarify because I'm having some difficulty understanding at this point, so I can have a conversation with you to see where we might be on two different roads here. Okay, and that's my time, so there we go, thanks. Thank you, Ms. Omez. Ms. Seismer Heiser. A 
couple questions. First, um, for the PD time for elementary teachers, which I'm very, or planning time, excuse me, I'm very supportive of, how is that going to work with our self-contained special education teachers, um, given that they don't necessarily have the same breaks for their students and or IEP hours, higher student needs? Well, I think it's a great question. I mean, some of those details we haven't worked out yet, but the idea, of course, is that we would have, you know, PD and planning time equity for all of our teachers. So that would be something that we would have to schedule out. Um, and we have had conversations with our elementary principals to get them prepared about um, the scheduling issues that they would need to address. And some of those questions came up earlier, I know, around the board table. So we would be partnering with our elementary principals to make sure that that happened in terms of equal amount of uh, planning time for all staff members. I just wanted to make sure that was intentional conversations yeah. because I've heard over the years, right, it's, it's, it's not an apples and apples comparison with those right. teachers and their needs. Um, uh, you know, I know we've talked back and forth about the PD. I will just say from my, my perspective, I think the PD is very important. I mean, how we, we have it out, we, we need to figure that out. But we have so many new initiatives, especially our trust policy, our SRNRs potentially policy, although I know we're still working on that. Um, literacy, you know, SEL as we continue to improve it that I think Fidelity of implementation is one of the most important things. If we don't have fidelity of implementation, we, we it, the policies don't mean that much, and, and PD is a big part of it. So, from my perspective, I'm very supportive of PD time for our, our teachers. To for that reason, um, I do think we need to make sure we're doing it in a way that that fits their needs and meets our needs as well. I, I would like to dig a little more into, um, you know, how you do the prioritization of your recruiting and retention funds. I mean, I know we have a, they call me Mister, which is, you know, a lot of money, and I, and I totally um, believe we need to have teachers that reflect our students, but I haven't seen anything in here about um, addressing some of our other significant needs or sub-shortage needs. You know, I hear throughout the year um, principals having to rely on staff that have other roles in the building, which means it makes it hard for them to do those other roles um, to, for the subs. Um, we have a significant special ed teacher shortage, and so do we have something that we're doing around specifically that and, and others? So I'll pause and, and ask about how the prioritization came about. So I, 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 that's a big question, probably could spend an entire work session on. <laughs> so I'll do my best to give some highlights and Sorry certainly if we need to follow up, we can do that. So, you know, ultimately, um, again, it's not a surprise to anyone around this table, the job market has shifted and ultimately the, the dynamic in terms of being able to obtain talent for large swaths of our, of our, our needs has, has become much more difficult. Um, we've recognized the ongoing need, especially in special education. Um, and so we have had uh, priority placed on programs that focus on pipeline. Um, you know, the, the classroom instructional support staff to special ed teacher pipeline is one example um, of an initiative that we have in place to help uh, bring more folks into the special education teaching field. We've been partnering with the Office of Professional Learning and Family Engagement um, to also offer opportunities for staff to take um, the, the entry level courses to get into the special education teaching field um, and providing that at, at uh, little to no cost for employees uh, who uh, make the commitment to uh, sign on as special education teachers to provide that uh, support for our students. We take every year, we look at uh, the data related to our, what I'll call traditional recruiting pipelines uh, in terms of where we're going uh, out to colleges and uh, to recruit uh, talent into to those uh, roles and make adjustments accordingly. We're constantly looking at which colleges are producing uh, a lot of high quality uh, teachers. And again, emphasis on some of our critical need areas, special ed being at the top of the list and ensuring that we have a presence on those college campuses, um, and also that we're trying to ensure that we're developing closer relationships beyond just showing up at a recruitment fair, but uh, having folks that can go out and serve in a role of uh, providing some uh, feedback through mock interviews, et cetera, et cetera. And so I, 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 I with, again, full day. <laughs> you know, I, I just, with all due respect, that didn't really answer my question, which is prioritization. 
So I can tell you that the, the, the program that we're talking about, uh, the Call Me Mr. program, is an additional program. We have nine positions built into the budget that the superintendent presented in January, two of those uh, specifically focused on recruitment efforts. Uh, when you look at the breakdown, it's two for recruitment specialists, one employment specialist, one coordinator for the substitute office. Uh, and then uh, as we're thinking about uh, uh, our uh, human resource uh, human resource information systems, ensuring that we have the staff available uh, to upgrade those systems. We have a domain architect. We also have a, be a benefits manager in the base, a compensation specialist, uh, an ADA coordinator, and an, an equity and employee relations investigator. So there are nine positions in the superintendent's previous budget, the new positions in the previous budget, and this one additional position in conjunction with the uh, program needs for Call Me Mister would be 10 uh, uh, positions. So our, I heard something about substitutes in that list you read to me, but um, it, it, I guess I would still really like to have more information, and I, I love you to death, Mr. McDonald, I really do, but on how did we get to this as the 10th position, you know, and what in those nine positions are we, because what you described to me was what recruitment we're already doing in-house. And this seems like a position you need to add to what you're doing in-house. How does what you're doing address the needs in those other areas where this didn't? That's what I'm trying to get with prioritization. I know my time is up, but that's the question I don't feel like I, I have enough information on. So I, I apologize that I missed the boat in my initial so, response. No, please don't. I I just, I, so I, I guess what... What we're looking at is identifying what the, the needs of the organization are and figuring out how to dole out those resources appropriately. So I don't, uh, one of the things, uh, Mr. Smith provided a listing of some of the resources that are part of the proposed budget. Uh, we have a very small recruitment team. And so in order to meet those needs, we prioritize the need to add two additional positions to that office in order to uh, facilitate some of the outreach and some of the pipeline programs that I outlined with the Call Me Mister program potentially being a third position within that team to focus specifically on pipeline. So I, I'm hoping that better, more closely we'll aligns. Take a call back, back okay. go back, go back if that's okay, or we can follow up offline if that's easier. L let, me, let me try one thing. I don't know if this is where you're going, and sometimes this is just, it's just dialogue. That's why we do this. And I think and I, I didn't figure it out, but the, the whole concept of subs as we know it is gonna have to go away. I mean, it's a broken system. Everybody in the country, my boys are in college, there's not sub professors, right? There's not. Uh, uh, no, I'm just saying, and, and don't laugh at what I'm saying, please, with all due respect. They're adults. They're okay, everything. with all due respect, I have the mic. And that's disrespectful. Not the first time either. Oh, yep. July 2020. Yeah, it is. Two more months of listening to your disrespect when I'm talking. Yeah, it's high time I said it though. Okay. The substitute issue is a national issue. Fairfax has no answers different from what anyone else has. In the end, some, some schools, some private schools, small schools, there are no subs. Those kids get rearranged, go to a different place, maybe instruction ends up being virtual, concurrent. I mean, that's the big idea. We haven't had time in the pandemic to go back and really look. What Sean said is the job market is changing and it's shrinking for subs. We lowered the number of hours to become a sub. We frequently increased the number of orientations to be a sub. And the good news is, is that our sub rates are a whole lot better than they were during the worst of the pandemic. We're back up in the 70s. We flirted with the 80s for a while. Of course, pre-pandemic, we were the 90s. Um, but long-term, long-term is the substitute, you know, is that the right paradigm to solve the problem? I think that's the deeper question you're asking. And, and, and I think we've been in a mindset of subs for as long as we've had public schools and education. And I think we're gonna to have to reimagine what we're really doing when a kid doesn't have their primary teacher there that day. Uh, and I don't think we have the answer uh, at. And I apologize for losing my temper a little bit, but with two months left, I just wanna be treated like a professional. We have a team here trying to do our best and, uh, and I'm gonna do my best till the last day I'm here. Thank you. 
Thank you, Dr. Brabrin. If we have a chance for going back, um, we will, but I want to get a prioritization of the board after we go through the remaining um, go back. So we have Ms. Darinette Koufax, followed by Ms. Paparsky. So, Dr. Brabrin, um, I, I would like to ask the question where were the teachers and employee groups on this plan that's presented to us regarding the PD? And um, the bus driver scales. Where were they? Are they in? Are, are they happy with what this looks like? Or so two things. The there was a group of employee groups that were with Marty and Sean. They agreed on the scale. They disagreed on the placement. So the placement to the scale. Whether you go over to the scale and get right. So there, there was a group of employees. I don't know exactly all the groups that were on there. They can tell you that it's a, it was a holistic group. Agreement to the new scale, not agreement on how to be placed. We recommend placing them as we placed all the other groups when we went to all these scale changes right as I came here that Dr. Garza had worked on, which is go to the next level uh, of where your pay would be and at least have 2%. The employee groups want to move over based on their current step number, and that's the $3.5 million question that I think is before the board. How do you want to move... How do you want to move them over? No one's against the scale that was created. It's just about how you get placed. And whether that placement affects, where would that, as Carl and some others said, will have us in the marketplace. Um, and again, we'll follow up to get some of those additional pay scales so you all can make your judgments as to whether that's close enough or do we need to go more or less. And we can work with you on that. I, on, the, go ahead. on the other one, our elementary principals, absolutely, instead of three days beforehand, right? Taking a day and giving them monitors to do professional development throughout the year so that they get the same professional development and planning time equal to middle and high, they absolutely have been uh, involved. They worked with me, with Sloan, with Jay. They are 100 percent stack who's for the before the pandemic we asked the teachers What's the biggest thing you want to solve? We were doing problems of practice. They said planning time. Please, please, please. And finally, we're giving them a solution to make planning time equal to middle and high. I think it's a huge win. Um, and I, I mean, do your own checking, of course, as I know you all will. But I think they're, they're going to be super excited. I didn't make any definites because I wanted to bring it to the board first, and I brought it today. But I think monitors, um, as recess monitors to allow elementary teachers more planning time and professional development time is going to be a huge win. Um, and I hope the board will support it. Okay. Um, I do want to reiterate um, what Ms. Omesh had talked about because we had done this before. We spent a long time on a calendar that was equitable and recognized um, you know, the needs of our teachers and students, um, that it, it has never been, I, I think there have been times, it has never been appreciated if um, we put a PD day on a religious holiday. So, because then they have to choose, right? They have to choose. And I'm not sure how we can fix this this year. But I want to say for the record that this is something that I've heard before. Um, this was something before we had all this calendar review that because of where um, Yom Kippur and Rosh Hashanah came about in the calendar, there were often PD days. Now we're doing the same, and that particular group wasn't happy, and now we're doing the same for Eid. So it's the same kind of, we, we really have to have, um, and I, I don't know how we can fix it this year, but I think it has to be fixed. Um, and I'm not certain I understand enough um, about where, how the Eid calendar, how the how Eid falls within the, your calendar, Ms. Omesh, to understand how far in advance we can work for that because I understand that's changing. But I feel like we really need to talk about that because it's a choice that have people have to make then. Yeah, I mean, I, I'll remind you, this, it is, it's a complex one for the board as we looked at equity in the calendar and trying to come up with a 180-day calendar. 
and balance the days. And we did bring the board a calendar that you approved that did one of the high holy days for the Jewish holiday as a, um, a day off and the other as professional development. So honestly, when I was looking at Eid, it was, okay, well, we balanced one for the Jewish faith this way. We can do that for, um, uh, for, for Eid the same way. It, it, you all could decide as a policy, you don't wanna do any professional development on any religious day. But we looked, some school districts are using professional development to do the, the day, some districts aren't. Um, and one of the follow-on motions was to look beyond the 180-day calendar. Now with this one E-day that we did do as professional work, we're at 179. Loudon's at 172. We can reimagine the number of days that we want to have for instruction, but there's a balancing act. It's, it's not just one thing. Everything here is a multiplicity of, of, of different factors, I think. But I, I definitely hear you. And the, what I've learned, and Ms. Omesh, please inform me, but a lunar calendar, sometimes it's based on the phase of the moon, and that can change. And it, it changes based on you know scientific knowledge of when that phase actually um, begins or ends. And um, so we have to be flexible as we understand um, when that changes and we're gonna work with our local community and frankly other divisions so that we're all on the same page. This is new, we're doing new stuff that we never did before. So we're learning too about how to connect and when to connect. And I think I suggested in my notes to you all a couple of weeks ago that if we can do, if we find out there's a change before the calendar, before the school year starts, we'll make that change in advance. And if it was during the year, again, this is my thinking, the board will ultimately decide if it happens during the year, we would make it a, an O day, a religious observance, cultural observance day. Okay. By the way, the PD that you all had wanted to see, comparison's been posted to board docs. I knew I'd seen it and Sloan has sent you an email. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Daranak Kofax. Ms. Pekarski. Okay, thank you. Before I get to the priorities, can you tell me a little bit about the, the uh, telehealth, um, you know, the deliver, what, Oh, <laughs> somebody, uh, if you have the information. Dr. Boyd is on virtually, okay. I believe. I didn't see her. I don't see Dr. Boyd virtually. I, I, I can share a little bit about this. Dr. Boyd and I met with the medical team. We met with the CSB. Um, there's definitely interest in doing telehealth. Um, I don't know the final numbers. I mean, and, and this is part of this sometimes. I know people want the plans, everything done. Sometimes it's preparing for what conceptually to do and then planning it. And maybe that's part of where the board goes. If you don't have all the plans, it's not a budget thing. Maybe. But it's the amount of work trying to do a multiple set of things. If you look through this budget, there's a lot of initiatives in here aligned with our strategic plan. Social emotional learning and, and supports for kids is huge. And telehealth is something the state is looking at and even the CSB. There's 500,000 would just be a placeholder. I don't know what the final amount, it could be far more. Frankly, when we've done our own internal numbers about how many kids might have needs, it would be a whole lot more. But what I heard from CSB themselves, what I heard in the meeting, with Michelle Boyd was there was an interest at least to pilot and begin this. And so I put a half million in and I made the call. I gave the number. They didn't give me the number. I said, I want something in so I don't have to wait on the county or Brian, with all due respect to Brian Hill and the county, I want my, we want our own money to be able to say, hey, can we start to pilot at least a few people offering that telehealth at a few schools? 500,000 started like a beginning. It could be a little bit less if we needed to, but I, I wanted to start with something and, and make sure there's some momentum because there was interest in the, the community meeting. Hey, we're willing to take a look at this. But we don't have final costing. Okay, well, that does answer my question. I was just trying to figure out what is your thinking around this. So, um, and I'm supportive of it. One of my priorities is mental health, which is why I wanna make sure no single school loses a counselor. Um, and, you know, we'll talk about how that's done. I know some will use ESSER funds, but we also know that some schools will not be getting um, enough money to cover an extra position. So we've got to find the difference. 
Um, and I look forward to seeing where you all land with the telehealth. Uh, I've heard from students, too, that for them, the SEL things that we're doing are great, but what they're really looking for is some more targeted um, you know, intervention. So I think this could be it. I've had kids ask me themselves about telehealth, so um, I, I, I am supportive of that. I support the professional development for all the reasons we've, we've all discussed, and I don't know enough about um, you know, the operational side of what we're doing to know exactly where we need, what we need, um, but I have to trust that you all do, and that is directly tied to student academic success. Uh, so for me, it's, it's a, a very uh, big priority. Uh, we need some more discussion around the bus drivers. I think we've all agreed there, and we'll be looking forward to that information. I did have um, a question, um, and some comments come up around the special ed chair salaries, and that there would be some difficulties recruiting for that position because it would be a pay cut. Uh, can somebody speak to that? I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to be sharing with the board an update uh, on that very soon. Let me give you the the, the the quick and dirty, and then Sean can jump in. But uh, I know Sean's been asked a lot of questions. This year, with Esther money, and next year, if you teach kids, or you have a caseload in your special ed, right? If you teach kids, and if you have a caseload, there are other special ed positions that don't have those things. We gave those folks an extra half hour of time. If you're in that category and you want to become a special ed department chair, depending on the number of days contract you have, some folks may take a small pay cut. But that's temporal. Am I said it incorrectly already? They won't receive the, the, the estate stipend. They'll go to this position. They'll make less money than what they were making with the additional ESSER money hourly. Um, let, me, let me go through and then you guys just fix it if not. We have temporary money for two years for folks who work with kids or have a caseload. Next year is it, unless we're going to cough up $24 million or so to fund this forever and ever. Maybe we will. I'm not prepared to put that on Dr. Reed or anybody else. Most districts didn't look at targeting special ed with ESSER money. We did because we thought it was that important to really retain our special ed teachers, of which We've had a teacher shortage, and special ed is the number one uh, shortage in Northern Virginia and certainly in Fairfax. We think the special ed department chair, even if you're coming off that and, oh, well, I'll make a little bit uh, less, I won't make as more, I won't make a, a whole lot more, a little bit less, this is a leadership opportunity for folks not to just become department chair of special ed, but ultimately like instructional coaches to become future administrators. Maybe they won't. Um, Plus, if we went and gave them that extra premium now and they don't have kids or uh, a caseload, we'd have to go back and rejigger the paying for all the people this year in special ed that we didn't give that extra to because they weren't directly either working with kids or in front of kids. So for all those reasons, we, we, we did not. Um, and, you know, what I hope is is that a lot of our teachers will still be interested in the opportunity to become that department chair and have that leadership opportunity, even if it's not for one more year, um, you know, a net bonus to them. And, and next year, that, that ESSER money is, is going to go away. We don't have another $24 million budgeted. Marty, anything I should add or Sean? So I could say that the premium for a teacher, uh, when you look at the additional uh, half hour, so from a 7.5 to an 8 hour contract a day that they're receiving, it essentially breaks out to about 13 days per year if you, you do the math. Uh, the new contract that teachers would be on is an additional 14 days. And so you go from a 194 day contract to a 208 day contract, uh, you would lose the half hour differential, but you're making more because you're you're working more days. So it, again, it's a difference between having a caseload and not having a caseload, but there, there would be no pay cuts uh, for individuals who wanted to move to that uh, new role. I have a little more, but I'm gonna save that for chairs. Um, two things, the middle school start times, at some point this board will have to decide this is a priority, there are things we can do with switching, I just, we have got to get there. I had a follow on last year. I don't think anything ever came of it. Um, it is directly tied to students' social and emotional mental health. 
we've got to fix it. We're doing a lot of things, but we never fix these, what I consider, others may disagree, very basic needs for kids. So, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pekarski. Do you want to go first, or do you want me to? Go ahead. Okay. So, um, kind of before we go to the next period, part of this meeting, which is to just go through the various priorities that I've heard from around the table so that we um, can come to an agreement. I would like to just add in a little bit about, I think we have to reimagine how we use the staffing reserve. Because Dr. Brabrand, you have raised the issue of we need to reimagine how we use substitutes. I would actually suggest that part of reimagining reimagining that staffing reserve is to reimagine how we or ensure that we hold harmless our schools for counseling and if possible actually increase counseling because we do know at least in the short term um, although I think it's a long-term issue that mental health has been um, and anxiety issues have been an issue for students pre-COVID and extended beyond COVID. Um, I also think that that staffing reserve would be an excellent location for having a, a core of substitute teachers that we would be able to send out across the county as necessary to address the unique needs of a school. For example, if they um, need extra substitutes based on a um, illness or even if they need it because they've got um, a number of staff members out due to um, uh, pregnancy or anything else. So I would ask that we kind of work with Dr. Reed to reimagine that going forward. Um, I also think it's going to be really important, and I fully support a deeper dive on how do we get here, get there from here on the middle school start times. There is another study that came out um, just this week on the importance of sleep for all of our students. Um, there are two driving factors for um, student mental health. One is sleep, and the other is to put down your cell phones and your social media and get outside. Um, so I will share that study with everybody. Um, and then um, I will hold off the rest. I've made a bunch of comments or taken down everybody's comments on priorities and we'll go through them next. But first, Ms. Tolan. Okay, just quickly a couple of things. Um, I also have in mental health issues and mental health of our students is huge on my list. And you can't pick up the newspaper. I mean, just in the last couple of days, there have been huge articles about, um, you know, nationally issues around student mental health. And so um, I, I will be providing, you know, Ms. Um, McLaughlin and I will work together. We're doing a skipped report at this coming board meeting. So we'll fill you in on some of the things we're, um, we're recording with the county. Um, but I definitely want to make sure, you know, staffing reserve, counselors, all of that, the conversation we've had here today that uh, we are making sure our schools are as staffed as they, they can be um, to help our students. Um, I would argue that um, our professional development money and particularly what we're talking about doing in elementary school is a part of our staff retention um, possibilities. And, um, I think we really, really need to think strategically about staff retention and staff um, uh, recruitment. And I know that we've been doing that. And I want to thank, um, you know, Marty and Sean for going through what positions, re reviewing for us what positions we had in the base budget. I just want to ask you sort of big picture. Do you feel like strategically with this national issue around the availability of staff for um, public schools that we're addressing that in the current budget? And how, how should we look to this in the future? I'll give you my initial reflection or reaction to that. And, and that is that I certainly appreciate the fact that uh, part of the original budget uh, that was presented and certainly with one of the additional items, there is priority given to adding some additional staff to help aid in the recruitment 
and also build out uh, uh, recruitment pipelines uh, to support our needs uh, to bring in not only teachers, but fill other positions across the organization. Uh, certainly, uh, it's a first step in, in perhaps a, a growth plan in the future. And, and I know Dr. Reed, when she comes in, will have uh, priorities and we'll, we'll likely engage with her around maybe some future needs. And, and I would share that retention is more than just uh, positions in HR. It's looking in totality for the, the things that we're talking about today additional professional development time for our employees. That's a way that you hold on to staff. We were having a meeting last week with our support employees and uh, one of our bus drivers, uh, she said that we need more time for professional development. That's a way that in, in addition to compensation that you hold on to and retain uh, staff. So when we look at positions in HR and in addition to more time for planning, more time uh, for professional development. Those are all things and, and uh, additional opportunities for professional development for staff who haven't uh, regularly gotten professional development. Those are all ways that we can retain staff. Thank you. I'm set. I'm all set. Thank you. So now if we can kind of what we Oh, Ms. Keys Gamara. Do you have comments you want to make on this part of the presentation or the discussion? We're going to unmute you. Hold on one moment. You're unmuted, Ms. Keys Gamara. Can you guys hear me now? We can hear you. Okay. So I was waiting for the portion on um, priorities. Okay, so do you want to tell us what your priorities are so we can add them to the list? Yeah, I, sure. Um, I would start with the professional development and planning time. Um, I do think we've got to support our uh, staff members and make sure that that happens. Uh, a real close uh, not even second, perhaps Ty is looking at the transportation scale, redesign, uh, perhaps take another look at how we might be able uh, to break that down and, and, and what would be the sweet spot to make sure that we're not losing or uh, losing those employees. Um, I also support the mental health, family liaison enhancement, a number of other things that have mentioned the telehealth. Um, but I just... Um, you know, I, I, I also would like to make sure we have a way to monitor uh, many of these programs. So, for example, if we if we simply have uh, the telehealth, how many of our students are using it, et cetera. So I think that's a summary of what my comments would be. Excellent. Thank you, Ms. Keys Gamara. So with that, um, if we want to start from the beginning, um, we have a number of areas that have been proposed by staff and uh, Dr. Braybrand. And then we've added a couple of other areas. So if we can go through that list and get a general idea of where people are, um, who is supportive of the plans for um, keeping the professional development at the level that it's planned by the superintendent, or would you like additional information on it if I can just say who's we're going to go through like yeah so hands. can we get a general show of hands with the professional development prioritization in this information or yes doctor uh, I almost made you dr. Frisch so mr. Frisch Right. That's hard to say yes or no. Okay. So who is uh, who has an interest in seeing um, additional questions answered on professional development? Yes. Okay. So we'll.
There isn't next steps with, with budgets. That's why we're in the situation we're in. So if you have specific questions you would like to have answered to help you better understand the professional development, there are two things. One, uh, Dr. Presidio did send out a chart which compares our amount of professional development to other jurisdictions. I think what would be helpful is to then also have a, these are the outstanding demands for professional development that we know we have for our staff. So, yes, Ms. Cohen. Or correct. If I could just make <clears throat> one clarification on that. I think until we know which, how many days, additional days might be approved by the board, it's a little hard for us to plan what activities would occur, but one of the options that we discussed was making that particular day on EAD a uh, staff self-directed professional development day to complete the required training. So it would be similar to a work day, even though it was titled something else. So again, once we have a, a general sense of how many days would be approved, we'll put that calendar together. And that would give the staff flexibility to either do it on that day or other days, correct. spread it out? Yeah, okay. correct. So, Dr. Presidio, I know that we provided um, quite a bit of information to the Board of Supervisors on their budget questions about what the plan was for PD. So we can look at that information again. Yeah, I mean, we're happy to get the Board whatever additional information you would need. We would just need your help kind of clarifying and specifying what that is, and then we're happy to pull that together. Excellent. We'll work with try to put together a package on the professional development piece. The next piece has on page 17 of the um, presentation has other initiatives, if we can pull those up. Back to like the scales, I, I, I feel like I need an understanding of how the scale was developed and, and I, I, I don't feel like, how are we going to get that information? Like how, how is that going to happen? So that was my, that was after this page, but I will okay. be happy Okay, well I to, thought you were. Um, we I, can go ahead, no I've got a whole, got every one of them, okay. but um, if we want to go to the scales, that actually I believe goes to, um, I think what you all asked for on the scales is you want to see the scales of the, the districts surrounding us where you be, we believe they will be with the budgets that they're passing for transportation. So then you can compare that with the scale that the committee agreed on and where 105% midpoint is on a, that scale compared to then what everybody else is going to have. That's what I thought I heard you saying that we'll work to get those scales. Um, um, that are available now that have been passed and, and do that uh, analysis of where that would land compared to where our midpoint would land. That's what I heard. Marty? And, and we can provide an, ex, uh, an explanation of the compression versus moving people over uh, from their current step to the commensurate step on the new scale. And the trend where it was last year, this year, and going forward with the new one. Yes, we, we can provide that trend. Uh, we've, as we included in the presentation today, you could see the increases over two years and, and what the total of that increase would be. Uh, so yes, we can provide that. And we'll also provide data on uh, bus drivers actually uh, separating from the system. Karen, is there an Equifax? Is that the type of information you're looking for? Okay. 
Sorry, I had yeah. Ms. Omesh has had her hand up, and then uh, Ms. Cohen. Yeah, there, I mean, there was the piece about um, where were they positioned on the steps. I think we need a, a back look a little bit on that's why we, that's different than just the scale, right? Where they were placed on the scale. Correct. I want to make that distinction. And then we passed over professional development. I had mentioned the piece on food and nutrition or just in general people who are under 11 months and what feasibility exists or what the costing would be for adding a day there. It's $10 million for each additional day of professional development. You're suggesting no, no. just for the, for the food and nutrition. Yeah, basically to under 11 month contracts. Okay, so can I offer that as part of the professional development they provide what the current plan is for each of those categories, including the food and nutrition, because I believe they have two days built in. Right, but then the bus drivers got an additional one that, that the under 11 month folks didn't. So just figuring out the cost of that, I think, right? Or the feasibility. Yeah, you wanna know it for food and nutrition, or are you talking all other employees? Well, let's get so. both. <laughs> Alice <laughs> let's separate, separate them. Alice has that. Um, we, we can get that information, Ms. Omish, if I can look for it. We might be able to get it to you by the end of this uh, question portion. Um, and I did just want to point out um, the distinction with what Ms. Omish was saying about the scale. So there's the scale of where people are going to be, which is one thing. And there's the implementation of the scale, which is where the disagreement was. Um, that's another thing that we would have to uncover from division. So I know we've talked about a lot of caps around the teacher scales and where, where teachers are placed. Um, where, and we need to get that information about non-teacher um, uh, scaled employees from our surrounding jurisdictions as well. So there's two components, implementation and then the scale design. Yeah, thank you. And especially as relating to the previous summer conversation we had as to how we landed here for the bus drivers. So yeah. Um, Ms. Omesh, it's uh, about 200000 to add a day for food services. So then perhaps, Karen, I don't know, the feasibility of that being rolled in, they can look into it. That will be part of the overall. If, if I can ask Point two million. Ms. Burden to, <coughs> ladies, I'm sorry. When you come to us with additional professional development, if you just add the cost of that extra and separate it out, so it's 600K for the bus drivers and transportation, 200K for our um, food services. So the, um, if we go to page 17, we have a number of different um, categories here. Special education, novice teacher support, but we've also heard from uh, members of this board that they would like to see intentional work on um, special ed teacher recruitment. So the question we have is, we have this and then the next page has the um, additional, if we go to the next page, I think it is. Recruiting and, thank you. Recruiting and retention strategies. If we can, okay. If we can get a, <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, right there. Under that, um, there's we have multiple phase, multiple pieces of that. Um, I'm sorry, Ms. Seismerheiser. Sure, if you want to. It's slide eight. So if we go through that, um, I think. So um, if we can, on the recruitment piece, if we can have some additional information on what we are currently doing 
to in, to build our pool of special ed and any sort of if there's some ways that we might want to look at moving money around to be more targeted in the recruitment of special ed yeah the prioritization there and then um, Ms. McLaughlin has the question regarding the salary scale extension, and I think this is similar to the discussion that we had regarding transportation. Well, except what this does is add an extension to not only teachers, but to everybody's pay scale. And so Ms. McLaughlin, was asking for additional information there on how this compares to other jurisdictions. Yeah, we, yeah we've got no calculation. The, what we're asking for is that data to com comparatively, because we do know that um, some of the neighboring jurisdictions have additional um, steps. How hard would it be to provide that data? That Ms. McLaughlin, I believe the homework was based on a request from this board as a follow-on motion to yeah. address. So I'm just saying, bring. Right. And so, you asked me to explain what I what I'm yeah. asking. No, for. I I think they everybody understands what we're asking for, which is a little bit more than. The homework which said you know the homework was this board asked for what it would cost to add just one additional uh, longevity step and what came back was not only adding a longevity step for our <coughs> teachers but adding a longevity step across all the pay scales so our staff so, didn't do the homework no they did actually they the other jurisdictions did. No, they did, and actually, Mr. We, we can provide the information. We, we, we've done the homework, and we can provide the information. Thank you. Do you want to answer that now, or do you want to just provide it to the We need to see it now. I, I, I mean, I can tell you I'm about, asking. I can tell you about teachers. Um, if you look at the maximum salaries for fiscal 22, as indicated in the WAVY guide, um, Fairfax uh, falls last at 106,354. Um, uh, the others range, I mean, I can give you the numbers, but you're right, it'll be easier to just see it. The others, you know, are 110, 118, 113. We're the lowest at 106, at the top of the scale. Ms. Burden, will it include their overall career earnings? Because that is how you do that. It's not just what their last s step is. It's what's their, if we're front loading how we pay people, then what's their total career earnings is how that was analysis was given to us in the past when we played with the scales. Yeah, I don't, I don't know about that. The, um, this data purely is reported from the other jurisdictions as the maximum salary um, for a teacher. Thank you, Ms. Burden. And if we can share those scales with the um, surrounding, uh, the scales in comparison of the surrounding districts, I think that will be important. Um, and if we have not only for the um, teachers, but for other categories, that would be appreciated. Thank you. Um, now we go down this list. We've talked about the recruitment, um, the family liaison scale enhancement. Um, we did have that study, and that's where we received this recommendation. And we've talked about the transportation scale redesign. Um, and regarding other priorities, 
the telehealth services. We've heard a lot of support for that. Um, if Dr. Brabrand, I know that you had given your um, brief description of this, but if Dr. Boyd could provide to this board a little bit more details on that, I think that would be helpful. Okay. Um, we've talked about the support for the library staffing for our high school special ed centers. Yes, Ms. Cohen. Yeah, we can do that, and and we're above those standards, but we can we'll get you the narrative on that, and you can look at that. Well, what can happen is a principal can make a decision; they have flexibility even under the state, um, the state to standards to reallocate, and some have. Um, for clerical staffing, yes. For clerical staffing, yes. So, Ms. Cohen, on that, would you want greater guidance given to the building level administrators on um, on that issue, or? Sure. or just somebody that Yeah. So does okay. staff do you on we'll you you're fine with that? Uh, no, we'll we'll set up. Actually, I'll I'll have uh, someone from our staff uh, follow up with you uh, with the appropriate uh, LT member um, to go over it and to share it with the rest of the board yeah. since it's a board discussion. Sure. sure. I, 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 yes, we'll get you the written narrative, but it sounded like you'd wanted a little one on one just to go back and forth. There's some staffing standards that give principals flexibility to say, oh, I've got an issue over here. Um, the SOQ has a little bit greater flexibility. And frankly, one of the things the Virginia Board of Education has been doing is trying to push, and they've been adding more and more flexibility because school districts don't want to be pigeonholed into one size fits all. They may have a different way they want to go as long as it's reallocated into something else that's still around a school improvement plan priority. It can't just be trading off to, and, and those trades go through all our region assistant superintendents right now, and they've taken extra scrutiny um, in the last year too. Dr. Ivy can discuss this, so could uh, Becky Boehnig, that they're not, it's not just a sign off, it's why are you doing this? What's the purpose of that? And we're trying to apply that too as it goes to library clerical staffing. Thank you. Um, then we have calm space and sensory rooms. I've heard only positive, but I just, anybody have any other questions about that? And then the school board initiative placeholder, I believe that is, uh, there are a number of different ideas that came to this board from different individuals, and I think that's an area where we do need to have further discussion. Um, on that. Then we have, um, if we go to, I believe it's the next page. Uh, yeah, 18. So we've gone through the professional development and recruitment now to the joint environmental task force and the recommendations there. Um, I've only, I have not heard from individual board members uh, a wish for more information except for a clarification on the get to green staffing. Is there more? Yes, Mr. Frisch. You've been demoted to Mr. again. <laughs> So is your intention to work within that 2.38 
or are you looking to Ms. Marin. Yeah, I just wanted to point colleagues to the budget question um, number 23 and number, gosh, is it the next one? Um, it's, well, 23 is about creating um, outdoor learning spaces. Uh, where is it? I just wrote it down to Tammy. Just give me one second, guys. Sorry. Um, well, it's the budget questions that I asked, <laughs> and um, it talks about the cost of the Get to Green changes and just know that the two positions that are being proposed are the result of months of budgeting out and planning and meeting with the Assistant Super for um, Instructional Services and Donna Volkman and facilities and it is a step forward onto a much larger scale multi-million dollar multi-year plan. So um, Donna Volkman actually handed me the org chart look you know what it is so um, I don't again if you just look in the budget questions it's right there so um, I just wanted to clarify that and I'm eager to hear, Mr. Fresh, what you think is hopping to do. I can also mention that it was just posted last week. I think it's budget question number 48, maybe 47, Oh, that's different. That's knowledge to me then. Which is the three-year three. jet plan, which includes the get to green numbers. Okay, so tw question 23 and tw 24 is where it has the two positions that Ms. Volkman talked about, the manager and the specialist. So if those responsibilities need to shift, you know, but but know that it is the result of a lot of planning around staffing. So I'm eager to hear the results of that budget response. I think mainly Thanks. the categorization that we're looking at is in the safe routes to school position. Okay, and I know we've spoken about that. Uh, and that uh, change should be very minor dollar-wise. I do I did want to point out, and um, you know, this issue about equity, and it relates to the conversation we just had about library clerical staff. Like, like I, I'm okay with flexibility, but once we start allowing change here and change there, well, then all of a sudden one school has six outdoor classrooms and another school has none. That's because the principal traded and decided to have a specialist be an outdoor educator, or another school the principal said, let me let the specialist be an AP director or a foreign language you know, instructor. You know, it's like, to what end? I, I want to approve clerical staff for li libraries because that's what they asked for. I don't want to then see those staff being traded out for something else because that that diminishes our Fairfax promise to them. So, you know, I'm glad they get counsel, but then we're gonna have a bunch of libraries where they're understaffed, they're like, well, we just funded you, but we traded them. So, I think we've gotta really clamp down on this, this moving around of staff. It's, you know, for what they're directed, you know, what the budget is directed to be funding. Yeah, I would just say part of this was this program review we all did earlier in the year, back in the fall, and then the CT study, which has been a little bit delayed to do together. This is a system with a history of flexibility for schools to make some individual choices. Um, and what, what does the board want to be loose on? And what does it want to be tight on on programs? I feel like there's more and more things that the board, as it's doing the budget, wants to see it in every school get to green, in every school outdoor classrooms. And I think as we keep moving forward, having that explicit in the budget language too about what's not gonna be tradable and what might still be. Um, I will tell you having gone to another district and then come back, principals being empowered to have some idea of the trade to meet the needs of the school is part of the secret sauce that I think has made this district so dynamic that makes people um, feel um, very uh, very attached to the community schools. They're not all alike, nor is our community completely monolithic too. So having some flexibility I think is good. It's just how much, and especially when it's new spending for a specific strategic purpose, I think we may need to be tighter and say, nope, that's not tradable spending. Mm -hmm. There needs to be a certain consistency from school to school to ensure the FCPS promise is honored. So Ms. Mayor and I fully agree with you. Thank you. Um, okay, so we've gone through all of the initiatives. We've gone through, so we've got a follow on list of what additional information individual board members need to have to make their decisions. And what uh, Ms. Tolan and I will do is reach out to each of you individually once this information is out there. 
to determine whether there's uh, a need for additional um, discussion as a board or if there is going to be amendments or follow-on motions um, to get to where we need to be. And yes, Ms. McLaughlin. I just have a question from what Ms. Dernat Kofax said and what Dr. Brabrand said in response. So um, Ms. Dernat Kofax said she made clear that she wanted to make sure we were doing work on the young scholars and our investment that we got from guidance on our outside consultants. Dr. Brabrand said that he remembered them talking about it. It didn't get carried through. So my concern when I think about this board, I think about our superintendent, I think about the division, if, if we're not going to pass a budget that invests in young scholars at roughly $500,000, which we made a commitment to in prior years, and now we've got funding to do it, I, I'd like for either this board through this, the budget chair to survey, do we want her to work with staff? Because I don't even understand how come staff didn't bring that to, like it shouldn't be incumbent on board members to just say something like, what are we doing in, in the areas of equity and advanced instruction, advanced education opportunities through like young scholars? So I, rather than amendments, I kind of like the superintendent's team to lead on this and, and add it back into the budget somehow. Again, that's just my view, but I feel like I've listened to our board as a body for years on this. So maybe survey if people are okay with that. Dr. Braybrun, you had said that you were going to send us additional information on this and how we could accomplish those two pieces, which was the um, uh, robotics and the algebra readiness uh, manipulatives. Yeah. yeah. And, and I then took. If you could also add in when you provide that as kind of a. Um, the background, we did add additional funding for Young Scholars last we did. year. Right. And that is in this year's budget. But it is. I, Ms. Dernat Kofax is talking above and beyond the distributions we made last year in the budget. And what I'll do um, is look at whether that can be something that we could be doing the operating budget or at year end um, to get those materials. Um, and year end is the summer, which still will allow us to be in a position to have that, those materials for um, the coming fall. Right. And, and uh, may I? <laughs> yes, Ms. Dernat Kofax. Thank you. Um, I heard Ms. McLaughlin speaking about this issue outside, so I know. Um, but but yes, there 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 has been analysis done um, by uh, you know um, the advanced uh, Miss. Uh, um, what? No, Miss Maloney. Maloney. Miss Maloney working with Miss um, Burden's team. So there's there, which I can share with the staff. Dr. Bray, Braybrand knows about this, and it's extremely. Um, as I said, something that, that's been needed and something that's just, that, that we don't, they don't have it. I didn't even realize they don't have it. They don't have these things. Right, and, and the trace is, I think you said you weren't at the meeting where we did the follow-on motion, so it wasn't in that bundle. Then we talked about it afterward. I didn't follow up with Sloan, but it wasn't in the follow-on motion, and so it didn't rejigger when we went back right. through it through the rest of the staff. But we'll either find it. Um, that's something we could do for the, the operating budget or at year end where we can do that one-time purchase. Yes. Can, can I would I, be reluctant to have it as a year end um, or as a standalone purchase just because it's that underlying ongoing concern of supporting the young scholars, if I understand correctly. Uh, I understand the preference. I just don't want to commit because I haven't sat with the team to figure out we're going to have to figure all this out between now and two weeks okay. for some other things, including where you all ultimately land with the transportation scale. This, so I, I mean, it may be an area, but I understand the preference for it to be an operating versus one time. Thank you. Thank um, you. And Ms. Omesh, I see your hand is up. Um, yeah. And I just want to know, let everybody know, we really do have to kind of wrap this session up because we have a whole other work session. Yeah, there were just a couple of loose ends I wanted to make sure. Um, one, I know translation was brought up, potentially looking at that to be included. Um, and then, do you want to? Uh, feeding. I know people talked about for next year providing meals, et cetera, especially with inflation, the economic conditions, whatnot, planning ahead for that. I think we, we need to 
have at least put some thought to it if we're going to have some follow-up items. Um, so those are two. Now, what did you mean by feeding? I mean, I know <laughs> we're not getting the, <laughs> the federal. Um, at this moment, Congress has not passed the extension for USDA support for schools. Just wanted to get clarification what you're thinking about. In anticipation of economic conditions and whatnot, we know that's going to be a barrier to learning next year. So um, I think we need to give some thought to what, I know there was like a reserve allocated for whatever school board, et cetera. Just giving some thought to what that might look like to plan ahead um, and financially incorporate that, right? I mean, Stella, I don't know if you had anything to add. I think there point were was a made. few rumblings. Yeah, several of us. Do something? Yeah. Okay. But well, when you say, shall we do something, you mean to cover the difference between the federal grant and um, or, or additional support to support kids' meals that may be done locally if the federal uh, folks don't Let, bring us money? Maybe we could talk okay. offline. That's good. Can I, offer, what I've heard. can I offer? That is a very large budget item. It is in the tens of millions of dollars. And I think before we have a commitment to doing that, it really requires a significant conversation at the board as to how, you know, is it everybody or, you know, today we give free lunches, I think what you're talking about, to anybody who qualifies even for reduced. And so, you know, what are the different? We well, give free to this, everybody. Yeah, free this year with COVID. But prior to that, it was. I don't think the intent. Let's just table this discussion and we'll try to get some of the questions answered outside of this medium. Sure, but I do think that the whole board needs to be briefed on it because it is a complex issue. I agree. I think there's a lot of things we still need to be briefed on, but we will talk about that tomorrow too. Okay. Thank you. Um, Ms. Cohen. Can I just ask, what's the plan? How do we get from where we are right now? Is that what you're about to say? Yes. Sorry. So Please where continue. we get from where we are right now to the 26th of May, when we have to adopt a budget, is we know, we've outlined the areas where more data, more information is needed for this board to make a decision. What I would like is that um, we give staff the opportunity to pull together as much as they can in the near term with a plan for providing more that a plan of action of when they'll you'll get additional information. And Ms. Tolan and I will meet with each one of you um, one on one to see what additional questions you have or whether or not you are thinking that you need to that you would like to offer an amendment to the budget and then we will put together a draft of all of the amendments to the budget circulating it to everybody and get a general consensus as to who can support individual pieces once again circling back to each of you and then we will make a proposal no later than um, the 23rd, which is three days before the budget is adopted, to the whole board to um, kind of plan where we're at. Or so an omnibus. an omnibus, ideally. That means that we essentially have um, 11 days, 11 calendar days to work this out. Is there any thought to our next work session would then be on the 24th, is that right? Is there any thought given to the idea of tacking on an hour or something to that to even ferret this out? I just, I feel like we're putting, I appreciate so much, we're putting a lot of responsibility on the two of you to have, you know, each of you six individual conversations, and we're not benefiting from those conversations with each other. So is there any thought so that we could add, I like what we did last time where we, at the end, once you had, everybody had to have their amendments in by that last work session, and we all kind of hashed them out, and we knew when we got there, what was it, 10 minutes or some record-breaking amount of time to get the budget done. So I think like as much work, even though it, I know that we have other priorities, but trying to put it in a work session format, I think would be ideal if that's even a possibility. I'm saying this as 
Stella's desperately checking to see what the next work session is. Well, that's what I'm doing mm -hmm. too. The next that work session is all the committee reports um, day, but um, I mean, we can certainly discuss it. I don't think you all are that far off. I think the biggest thing, there's a few things here, the materials, but the biggest thing, frankly, is the scale. Yeah. And that's a, that's a three, $4 million question. Yeah. Um, I, I can look into the food, better understand that on the side. I, I agree, it, that's millions and millions, but um, the biggest thing, I think, is the scale. And I don't think you're that far apart. The scale and perhaps the school board initiatives, uh, and Mr. Frisch talked about having some conversations with board members for greater granularity. Again, it can stay a placeholder even when you vote on it in two weeks if you wish, but we're not gonna move forward and as administration act on that unless it's clear what it is. So we left it broader. Um, I don't really think we're that far off, believe it or not, but I'm, I may be wrong. Uh, I don't think we are. Thanks. So we as the budget chair and vice chair do not have the ability to set the agenda for the board. Um, I know that Ms. Pekarski is always juggling everybody's priorities. I'm going to leave it up to Ms. Pekarski and Ms. Sizemore Heiser and staff during their um, weekly chairs to determine whether or not we can carve out, and I would limit it and I would put it at the end of the day um, of an hour, an hour and a half to um, figure this out. but by putting it at the end of the day, if we're able to resolve much of it prior to then, then we have more flexibility. Does that work for you, Ms. Sizemore, or uh, Ms. Pekarski? We can Take try. Take it, it on your back. I cannot commit to it, but I guess we'll look and see what we can do. I don't think you all will that fall apart, is what I would say. I think there's consensus on almost every single thing except transportation scale, a little bit more for what Tammy talked about and clarification on the initiatives and uh, maybe something on food. But, um, you know, which again, I, I, that one may be something we'll have to, as you said, study later. But transportation seems to me to be the big, big one. And the scales can help us see how much closer, or you can see how much closer we are to whether you think it needs adjusting. So we'll and work on it. We can get something together soon. And we know that we will have more clarity if not by the time we adopt this budget, but soon after as to what we will be getting from the state. And with the state um, removing the support cap, that should give us some flexibility in that area. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we are very far over on this, but I think it was an important discussion to be had amongst everybody around the table. Um, so with that, I would like to end this portion of the work session and move to the family life education presentation. Thank you. Uh, staff, you are incredible. And you have the patience of Job, and it is greatly appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. All right, well, a five minute break maybe for five, what do you think? Sure, five minutes. Five minutes, okay. So we will reconvene at 325. Sorry, I'll start over. Yeah. <clears throat> Motion. School Board Appeals Committee moves to overrule the division superintendent's determination decision for a student who was found responsible for an offense under Regulation 2118 based upon procedural irregularities that affected the determination, including lack of adherence to the timeline, to the timelines, trying to read John's handwriting, laid out in the regulation. Second.